Cool. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's stream. Uh, today we're going to work a little bit on the i3 tiling window manager. Um, there are like a lot of different users with a lot of different levels of familiarity with i3. Uh, so it's going to be hard to produce content that is going to be appealing to everyone. So if you've just started i3, it's going to be something entirely different to you than if you've been using it for years. Um, this typically goes without saying, but I just want to stress it for this particular stream. So my assumption is going to be that I'm going to be talking at a very like advanced level. And whenever you need me to dumb it down a little bit or go into detail on any particular aspect of it, um, please just let me know in the chat. Um, and then we can totally dive in or take a little detour and then I'm going to explain to you how things work. Um, oh, this actually reminds me, I think I have not actually set up the uh, Nightbot for Twitch yet correctly to actually reply to the i3 chat command. Um, so I think I'm just gonna, yeah, <laughs> I think that's missing actually. So uh, let me just add this real quick. Um, in the meantime, so the, the website, you can already see it on stream. Uh, i3 time manager, colon, submit. Cool. Um, yeah, in the chat, the uh, exclamation point i3 command should work now. Um, cool. So, um, you know, everybody, every one of you is using a window manager. Some of you might not know which one or that they are using one, but everybody is. Uh, it is a part of the X11 stack. Um, sure, there is Wayland now, and not everybody's using X11 anymore. Um, so, those people are using a combination, so to say, um, of desktop environment and window manager and compositor, like the, the model is a little bit different in Wayland, but in, in X11, you have a separate program that is your window manager. Um, there are a couple of well-known ones, obviously the ones that come with the bigger desktop environments, such as GNOME's or KDE's or XFCE's window manager, um, whichever code name they have right now. Um, I think for, um, for um, KDE, it's KWIN. Um, GNOME used to be Metacity for the longest time. I think now it's Mutter. Um, there's a there's a bunch of big ones, but um, i3 is a small one. I started it in 2009, um, so it is over 10 years old at this point. Cool. Um, lots of talking. Um, recently came to know that you stream. I've been using i3 for almost a year now. Thanks. Yeah, great to hear. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying i3, or you know, so it sounds. Um, cool. So let me um, pull up the issues here. Um, so I have this global view on issues that um, I'm working on on stream. Um, today, I'm predominantly going to try and do i3 things, though um, I've had a quick look at a couple of issues and I have marked four originally for the stream, but only three remain now that I've done the prep work. Um, the fourth one was about um, a different way of implementing the system tray, and I'm not necessarily convinced right now that it's a good idea to still do that. Um, but you can read up on the issue for details if you want to. Um, if there are any sort of um, issues that you are aware of yourself, whether it is because you've <laughs> looked at our bug tracker or because you have actually run into an issue and you would like to see it addressed on stream, um, just let me know. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to start with a simple one and then progressively go into the harder ones. Um, I also have one thing that is uh, not on this list, um, which we might get into later. Um, and then I have a, a couple of other things also that we can talk about, but um, we're just going to see where this takes us. Cool. Um, so, um, yeah, let me see. Is there anything I want to demo? Um, what you can see here at the bottom of the screen uh, when I hold down the modifier key is i3 bar. Um, and it allows me to switch between uh, workspaces. I have this uh, new workspace here, which I haven't had before, where the Twitch chat is uh, related to IRC. Um, so now, if I want to paste in a URL or you want to send me a URL, I can actually much more conveniently. Uh, see it here. Um, and then, um, yeah, let me just talk a little bit about the work environment that we're going to be using here. So um, on the first workspace, workspace one, I just have like a full screen Emacs. Uh, I have configured this version of i3 here a little bit differently for the purpose of streaming than I would normally configure my i3. Um, in particular, I have removed all of the window decorations because they take up more space than I'm comfortable with on stream. Um, but typically I have them enabled for clarity. Um, here they are enabled in such a way that if I open more windows, um, they will be displayed again. So now we can see that this is the Emacs window in the i3 directory 
But if I close these again, then uh, and you know if if there's no longer any question about what is on screen, then it will strip the decorations. Um, also, of course, the i3 bar uh, mode is set to hide, which means that it is hidden unless I press the modifier um, so that it doesn't take up space on stream again. Then um, I have a browser here on my second workspace um, and I have a couple more workspaces. Uh, in general, for like, you know, on, on my non-stream setup on my regular workspace workstation, I have set up everything such that um, if I do, let me see, yeah. Um, I use the workspace layout stacked, um, and usually I have just two stacks like shown here. Um, sometimes I have the proportions varied a little bit. 60 to 40 is a good uh, ratio, typically, depending on the screen size. It's not great here on the small screen, but you know, just bear with me and imagine doing this on a larger screen. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, this is how things would look like. I have workspaces for projects, so I have usually one workspace per project. Um, again, for streaming, it's a little bit different, but typically I would have like one workspace to work on Distri, one workspace to work on i3, one workspace to work on Go Crazy, etc. They're not necessarily all open at the same time, though if I'm switching around between projects a lot, then it can happen that multiple of them are open. Um, and then it becomes very, uh, very hard to navigate them at some point, um, which is, you know, just a good reminder that you need to clean up windows and tabs from time to time. Um, good afternoon, Matt. Nice to have you here. So let's see. Um, yeah, okay. So this issue here, uh, we can go through it a little bit. It um, it was submitted on January 5th, so it's not actually that old. Um, and it's talking about a way to get the current binding mode through IPC without waiting for a mode event. Um, midnight here. Oh, wow, yeah. Thanks for still uh, sticking with us. Uh, let's see how long you... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I 3Stim, uh, a long time user here. Nice to see you. Um, hope you enjoy. So um, yeah, this talks about the current binding mode and it talks about the IPC interface and it talks about mode events. So there's a lot of lingo here that we are gonna unpack. Um, so let me pull up the website. Um, one of the big focuses of the i3 project from the very beginning has been good documentation. So of course we have a very prominently featured documentation section where we break it down into uh, documentation for users where most prominently the user's guide is um, everything that you need to get started with i3, really. Um, and then we have a bunch of uh, information for developers. Now, um, IPC is the term that we've mentioned. It stands for Inter-Process Communication Interface. Um, and i3 is using a simplistic interface, for better or for worse. Um, I think if I were to redesign it today, I would do it a little bit differently. There are a couple of, of clutches, which is why we suggests that you use an existing library so that you know for whichever language you prefer to interface i3 with um, be it you know may, maybe you write your scripts in python or perl or you write programs in go or even shell or you know what have you there are existing solutions um, if we click on libraries we can see that there is um, one choice here for c a couple more for c plus plus there is an official uh, package for go which i would recommend you use and report feedback if it doesn't work for you um, an official package for Perl that we use in our test suite extensively, so it's well tested. Um, a couple of choices for Python, though only one maintained one. Uh, Ruby, Rust, or Camel. Um, I bet there are uh, a couple ones in here, uh, or there are a couple ones out there that are not in here. Uh, if you know of any additional ones, um, please just send a pull request to add it to the list here. So the IPC interface allows you to, uh, after connecting to i3, you can either send it messages to make it do things, such as you can run a command, uh, which is very similar to the commands that you combine to the keys. So it's like the same entry point. Instead of uh, reacting to a key press, it's reacting to an IPC message. And then there are also uh, receiving replies from i3, of course, for the commands that you send. There's also a way to subscribe to events um, so actually, let me just go back to the table of contents and skip all of this. Um, so this really goes both ways. So you can be informed about things happening in i3, such as you know a new window being opened or the user switching to a different workspace, a workspace being created. And this allows you to customize all sorts of things. Um, let's go through an example here. There is a specific type, um, and in this case, uh, the mode event type has been mentioned in the issue. So we're going to look at what that does specifically. Uh, and then there is a bunch of stuff that is 
common to uh, how to receive your events. Um, we're going to probably dive deeper into you know, Unix sockets and, and IPC interface and the like in a later issue, if we're going to get around to it, to address this on stream, um, where we're looking to change away from the way we're streaming logs out of i3 um, to make it a little bit more robust. Anyway, so um, there's workspace event, mode event. This is the one we're looking for. So this event consists of a single serialized map. That's very common. Uh, everything is JSON here, um, containing a property change, which holds the name of the current mode in use. The name is the same as specified in config when creating a mode. The default mode is simply named default. It contains the second property, pango markup, which defines whether pango markup shall be used for displaying this mode. Um, so this is for um, primarily for bars such as i3 bar, where if you enter a different binding mode, then uh, it will show you an indicator kind of shaped like a workspace. Now, um, let's pull up the user guide here, search it for mode, um, and then actually go to the binding modes. All right, so modes are kind of like modes in BIM, right? You change them and then a different set of key bindings is active. So we use this here in the example um, to have like a little launcher with a couple of like one short, one key binding shortcut uh, programs to launch. So in this example, if you pressed your modifier key followed by O, it would enter the launcher mode and then it would allow you to either launch Firefox or Thunderbird depending on which key you press next. And as you can see for the key bindings here, we don't have a modifier attached. And this is because the entire set of key bindings is switched from the default to a mode where only these are active. So it's kind of like you know a sub command for i3 or you know I, I think you get the idea, right? Um, and we actually do have in the example config. So if I do cut slash etc slash i3 slash config, uh, you can see that we actually do have a mode predefined, and that is the resize mode. Uh, you can enter it using your modifier followed by R for resize, and then you have uh, bindings for the arrow directions um, here and for the ones that correspond to the arrows on the home row um, to resize, grow, shrink, etc. cetera, um, the, the window that you're dealing with. Um, so this is for like resizing a window like with your keyboard, um, but you can also totally do it with your mouse, which might often be more convenient. So the resize mode is sort of a good example for how to do something modally, but not necessarily the recommended workflow. Um, so let me let me try to, to illustrate a difference here. So uh, if I open another window like this, and um, if I just click in the middle of the two, I can freely resize them like so. Um, I can also do the same thing if I hold down the modifier key, and you can see the i3 bar pop up at the bottom of the screen as I do this, and then right click, roughly uh, between these windows, I can actually also right click um, into the window itself. Like if I click here, you can see that the cursor jumps and then I can still drag it. So this is a very easy way of uh, resizing windows without having to be too precise. Uh, so if you've been struggling to like move your mouse cursor in between the border between two windows, uh, a trick to do this more easily is to just hold down the modifier and right click anywhere uh, and just resize like that. Uh, so that is what I'm personally using. Like whenever I'm resizing, I'm doing it with the mouse. I think there are advantages to using the keyboard and there are advantages to using the mouse. And the question is when do you use which and for what? Hi, thanks for the great job with i3. Really enjoying it for almost a year now. Glad to hear. Uh, welcome to the stream. All right, um, so let's see if we can actually get the, um, get the resize mode going. Are you coding i3 or in i3? Both kinda. <laughs> Um, I will be working on i3, but I also happen to be using i3. So that's why it's both. Um, let's see. So in here, in my local i3 config, um, oh yeah, I don't have the resize mode configured, mm, but I do have a volume mode configured, um, which I enter by mod v. Yeah, so now you can see right after my workspaces, you can see the volume indicator. Um, and now if I just press, um, well, you can't see the effects of it, but if I press, for example, seven, uh, it's gonna toggle, uh, or it's gonna set the volume to 70% um, of the maximum. Um, and if I just press escape, uh, it exits the mode again. 
So modes are not super visible, which is why we have the indicator for them in the i3 bar. Have you tried any other window managers? If yes, how was your experience? Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I have used other window managers because um, it's kind of a big hurdle to start using a, a graphical Linux interface if you have to first write your own window manager from scratch without ever having used any other one. Um, sorry about being pedantic about this. Uh, yeah, so um, originally when I installed Linux first, um, it came on a CD set and the internet wasn't a big thing. Uh, and you just had like uh, the GNOME interface. Um, I think at the time I had friends who were using KDE by choice, um, but GNOME was sort of the big mainstream one. And um, at some point, like, you know, once I installed Linux and started using it uh, earnestly and was into it for a couple of years, um, I was introduced to friends who were using the Enlightenment window manager or uh, environment rather. I think it is a little bit bigger in scope than just a window manager. It, it perceives itself as a desktop environment. Um, and Enlightenment was pretty cool. Um, and I had other friends who were using like more niche window managers. Um, uh, a midnal saying started with TWM, yeah, very old school. Um, I have used TWM briefly as well, uh, not earnestly though, only ever for like testing or trying it out. Um, yeah, and so I had a couple of friends who were using, I don't know if it's if it was TWM, I don't think so. I think WMI was a big one at the time um, and maybe others like DWM, I don't know. Um, so I was using Enlightenment because my friends were using it for a while, but I was uh, also looking at other friends who were having all of these cool tiling window manager features and I figured um, there should be tiling in Enlightenment. Um, so actually, if we look at Enlightenment tiling, um, there is actually a tiling module. Um, let's see if there's any trace left. Maybe not necessarily. Let's see if I can actually find this. Yeah. Well, there are some traces for it, um, <laughs> some traces of it. Yeah, so I originally actually wrote a tiling module for Enlightenment 17. And then at some point it became pretty obvious that, um, you know, the, the Enlightenment window manager was just not made for tiling, obviously, right? Because you know, I added tiling to it, so it kind of been made for it. Um, and there were just a couple of shortcomings that were hard to address if you're modifying like a big existing uh, desktop environment. And if you start your own project, you have all of the freedom to do anything you want. All right, um, I'm in Fedora GNOME Shell. Um, I want to move to Arch with Tiled Window Managers, but it is a bit scary to make a jump since I only have one computer with one OS. I think I will virtualize it first. Yeah, that is a good idea. Um, virtualization definitely helps. You can also just work in a separate user account. This is what I would recommend. So, uh, you know, when you log into your computer in like GDM or whatever login manager you use, um, just create a new user account for your computer and use that when logging in. And then you'll have like standard settings and a fresh uh, profile to play around with. Uh, and you can just install any window manager. And if you don't like it, you just switch back to your main user. And if you do like it, you can change your main user once you become comfortable with it. Uh, you can also, there's also many other ways. Virtualization, as you mentioned, is a good way. Uh, you can also start an X server within X. So um, if I go here and I, I think I actually still have it. Yeah, if I start Zephyr like this, you can see that I have like this uh, black window here. Let me actually, if I start a terminal in this, you can see that it's starting here. Um, so this is sort of like a very, very easy way of uh, having an X session within an X session. So if you wanted to just try a different window manager, you could try it within Zephyr. All right, uh, let's close this down. Um, is there any way to have WMI, st uh, WMI style Windows stacking in i3 without patching the source code? There is not. Um, we like the way we stack Windows better. I mean, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't have done it uh, like that. In general, we try to not have too many options for customizing how things look um, because they need to be tested individually um, and it's very easy to break them and then you just blow up your support matrix and it's not, it's not a good thing. Um, all right, yeah, I was saying um, I contributed this Enlightenment uh, tiling module and then uh, at some point I just switched to WMI because I was more comfortable with like a full tiling window manager and then WMI started to um, not exactly do what we wanted to, like the group of friends and I, um, in particular, and it might sound silly, but they were introducing, let me see if I can find a screenshot. Um, they were introducing these little helpers. 
in in the corners of the windows here where um, I think it was for drag and drop or something and it was not configurable. Um, and we were thinking at the time, well, the, the change in look and feel really bugs us and we would like to revert it or, or you know, opt out of it, uh, which is ironic given that I just answered a question about look and feel saying you shouldn't have too many options, which, you know, fair. Um, but at the time we were unhappy about it and we wanted to at least have a local patch or something. And we started looking into this and it was so hard to figure out what WMI was doing um, because we had just a really hard time getting into the source code. It was not structured in a way that it was accessible to us as outsiders. Um, and so we, we tried doing something about this. We actually had like an exchange with the maintainer at the time to add documentation in many, many places. Um, and it kind of slowly got better, but it didn't get better fast enough. Um, and when we then started actually working on the WMI source code, we found a couple of other things that we wanted to change that just weren't possible. And then at some point we were just so frustrated and gave up um, that we sort of put it aside and didn't work on this anymore. Um, and later on, like independently, the topic came up a couple of times again. And at some point we were like, oh yeah, this is like a really cool idea of how to do like a tabular layout, which wasn't possible in WMI, at, sorry, WMI at the time at all. Like it only did columns, um, which, you know, I think nowadays I would actually be content with for most of my working style. But at the time we really wanted more flexibility. Um, and we had an idea of how to do it. And then at some point we just tried if it would work out and it did kind of work out. And then we just uh, continued the streak, so to say, and developed this from a single uh, C file that was just essentially arranging terminals on your desktop to simulate what a window manager would do into like a full-blown window manager. That is sort of the, the origin story. Um, and there's like many nuances to that. So let me know if there's any particular thing you want to hear. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. All right, cool. So, um, okay, so I've, I've shown you what modes are. Um, now, let's circle back to this issue. Now that we have an understanding of what you can do with the IPC interface, namely talk to i3 and listen to what i3 is saying um, and see what the what the bug reporter wants. They're saying at the moment, there's no way to get the current binding mode from i3. So we cannot query whether we're in the default mode or for example, in the volume mode. This is an issue for initialization of a status bar. Yes, it can be worked around by subscribing to mode event and waiting for mode change or forcing a mode event by sending the request to change binding mode, but this is not a proper solution, to which I would agree. Um, desired behavior. There are two clean ways to resolve the issue. Add support for a new IPC request, for example, get current binding mode, or expand get binding modes to also provide info about the current binding mode, either as a string or an index for the already provided list of available binding modes. Um, all of this sounds vaguely reasonable. Um, adding a new request, possible. Uh, extending an already existing request to just provide more info sounds more appealing, excuse me, because there is less plumbing work to do. Uh, providing it as a string is certainly the right choice here. Um, the index would be unusual in terms of how the rest of the IPC interface looks like. Uh, and just being explicit about it by just giving the full string contents sounds like a good choice here. Um, there's no need to be super efficient. All right, um, so then there's a little bit of back and forth. Um, and at some point um, it was accepted. And uh, before we actually start any work, let's first assign it to ourselves so that nobody else um, does any duplicate work on this. Cool, um, let me know in the chat if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I think um, we're gonna dive right in. Um, so I could start by like walking through the source code now, but I think we're going to start the other way around. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the testing story that we have. Um, so in the i3 tree, there is a directory called test cases. And within it, there is a T subdirectory, which is uh, common Perl style, if you're wondering where that convention comes from, um, because our test suite is written entirely in Perl. Um, it was a you know, it was it was a, a natural choice at the time, I would say. Um, maybe Perl was already on its way out, but you know, today it, it looks a little bit outdated or old fashioned, um, but certainly the language is nice in that it is more expressive than C, which is nice for a test case where you need to have like a high level um, view or a high level picture of things uh, and want to express it quickly. Um, and it is dynamic enough, so you don't have to deal with all of the minutia that you have to deal with in C. 
Um, nowadays, there might be other languages, um, but yeah, at the time we started in Perl and now we have a lot of test cases. So um, we cannot reasonably switch away from it. Just no point in doing so. Um, all right, so we have this test cases thing and there is a program in there called complete run, which will do a complete run of all the tests. Um, I have already set up my compile command in my editor here uh, so that it changes into the i3 build directory and runs ninja test. Ninja test is, so ninja is like a replacement for make if you're not familiar with, and ninja test will just run complete run um, and it will just print the result like this and it is relatively readable, but as you can also see, it just says, okay one um, and not much more and then there is a full lock which we will open here um, and then this is where the complete run output so you can see the command here it runs Perl complete run and then the standard out and this is the actual output of the test suite runner we can also just run a complete run directly um, but running it via ninja ensures that all of the dependencies are rebuilt and up to date So it is preferable to run it via ninja though If later on we might iterate on a specific test It might be better to call complete run and specify the individual test case that we want to run instead of running all of the tests uh, I want to point your attention to one thing though, which is that we have currently 250 test files that have 3620 individual test instructions so you can see this is really a lot of different tests, which is why I'm saying that switching these away to any other language is a hopeless endeavor. Um, and you can also see that it only takes seven wall clock seconds to run these. Um, on my other account, I think it is a little bit faster. I'm not entirely sure why it was so slow here. Maybe this was because it was a cold run and maybe it'll be faster if we just run it again. Let's give that a try. Um, let's see, random question. Do you like Ruby? Um, I think there is a, a use case for it. Um, like the, the sort of you know domain specific languages that you can express in Ruby and the community regard for expressing such DSLs uh, strikes me as like a, a good balance if that is a thing that is relevant in your particular use case. Um, nowadays, like for me personally in my life, there is not a lot of Ruby code. Um, I wouldn't really know what there is that I'm like actively using on my own computers or running on my own computers. Um, of course, I think um, GitLab, for example, is uh, Ruby on Rails. I think GitHub is also still largely Ruby. Um, so certainly there is Ruby software that I am using um, and I'm, I'm not against the language. Um, I'm just not personally using it a lot. All right. Um, okay, so it, it did get a little bit faster, five seconds. Um, I think values of three seconds or so are what I would typically expect on a fast computer. But um, regardless, what I'm just trying to, to say here is that it is fast enough to be in like the iteration loop. So you can just change any part of i3, rerun all of the tests, and then be very confident that either uh, your change hasn't broken anything else, um, you know, or you will immediately find which things you've broken. Um, the, I also want to stress that having a test suite is really, really important for the long-term maintenance and health of your open source project. Uh, in i3, we have started out with a test suite because as such, like similar to the good documentation aspect of the project, um, having it follow good software engineering principles in general was one of the things we wanted to do. Um, so we not only have documentation for users, we also have documentation for developers. We have an extensive test suite. Um, we we have a good continuous integration set up. All of the code is um, automatically formatted um, as per Clang format and, and stuff like that, right? We, we try to be um, at least relatively on top of modern practices as far as time permits uh, in, in an open source spare time project. Um, where was I? So yeah, okay, yeah, the importance of test suite. So uh, we started out with a relatively simple test suite and we just expanded it more and more over the years. And it has become very, very clear that many features we could only implement because we had the reassurances of the test suite that we don't break anything else. Um, because you know, if you go through the issue tracker, you will find many thousands, literally thousands of issues that uh, deal with compatibility with other programs, that deal with edge case behaviors that have painstakingly been analyzed and corrected, and it would be a shame to regress in any of these dimensions. So whenever we actually fix something, we add a test to make sure that we don't break it in the future. Uh, and these tests are so, so valuable. Um, and I think any change that you would want to do on i3 would take much, much longer, and there will be much more breakage if we didn't have the test suite. 
And it is even more surprising to me because of my views like that, that, for example, Sway, the last time I looked, didn't have any automated tests at all, and they were not looking to add any. And I think that is a really bad decision long term. But hey, what works for them works for them. All right, um, so we have a test suite. We know that it is working. We can run it so we can easily verify our changes that we are about to make. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, one thing to do would be to look at, uh, let me see, I'm just gonna grab for mode in the test directory. Oh yeah, that's not gonna be good because um, our preamble uh, contains a link to the modern Perl book. Uh, so we have way too many hits. Um, let's say mode blank. Yeah, and then we can find, let me make this bigger. We can find a couple of files which um, do something with binding modes. So they're not sorted alphabetically, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the order is just so that you can quickly identify uh, a test without having to type its full name if you want to rerun an individual test uh, via the complete run wrapper. So let's see which one is like a basic test for modes um, that we can just use to extend. So there is a 199 IPC mode event. Um, that sounds like, yeah, that is simple enough, right? So um, let me walk you through this test. We have a preamble at the top, which ensures that people who are just looking into the test suite for the first time, because they have just submitted a pull request and they have been told that the tests broke or that they should add a new test for their behavior change. Um, and this is now an obstacle, right? So they are like, oh, okay, the change is already done, like the work is done, but the, the pull request requires a test before it will be merged. Um, so they, they have a mindset or an attitude of, okay, this is an obstacle for me, I just wanna get this out of the way. Um, so it really helps if we give them pointers at every step of the way um, to make them do the right thing. Uh, such as in this case, um, read a couple of documents before working on the tests. And it is really in their own best self-interest um, because these documents generally try to be helpful for developers uh, who are working with the tests. Like it explains the overall structure, uh, it explains things that you need to pay attention to, um, you know. And then the, the last one is the modern Perl link that I mentioned, um, where if you are not familiar with Perl already, then this is a great introduction, which will teach you just enough Perl to be dangerous in the context of these test suites. Um, coincidentally, like you might need to pick and choose a couple of the chapters in there. It's a good book regardless of what you're working on. All right, um, and uh, yeah, so we give people pointers so that people don't spend a lot of time figuring out how the tests work and get frustrated and then give up and maybe not carry on with their contribution to the project. Instead, we wanna um, like really be helpful, give them good examples, give them good documentation at every step of the way of the contribution. So that's why this comment is in all of the test files because if they just happen to copy and paste one that they think looks good, they will still have the comment and then maybe they'll read it. If they don't read it, um, well, we tried at least. Cool, so this is the, the long preamble. Then uh, we have a use i3 test statement and we give this module a parameter, which is the i3 config file contents. Uh, the, this instruction here just tells the i3 config file parser which version it is. Um, there used to be a version three of i3 many, many years ago and the config files are still transparently upgraded if you happen to have a v3 config file, though you should really upgrade. At some point, we're gonna remove the support for upgrading these transparently, I think. Um, I think there has been like a nag bar warning for many, many years. Um, apologies to new i3 users who don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, all right, so then it defines two modes that are then gonna be used in the test later on. We have a mode M1 with a key binding that does not foo, and then we have uh, a mode that contains spaces. So that's sort of an edge case for the mode names here, maybe, um, I guess that's why it was chosen. Um, I have to say I haven't written all of these tests, so I'm walking through them as if I hadn't written them because maybe I haven't. Um, in, in either case, I'm no longer familiar with them because it was many years ago. So, um, you know, I, I might have a slight advantage, but basically we're coming from the same page here um, if you don't have a lot of experience with i3. Cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, now that we have these modes, what we're doing now is we are subscribing to events, uh, in particular the mode event, that's the second parameter, and the first parameter is a callback that will be run whenever uh, we get an, a message here. And then, let's see, um, we just look at the change field 
of the event and we check that it says m1 and then we're done with the test oh um in fact sorry this is not the callback that is being run sorry i explained this wrong see this is why i'm saying that um i know just as little as you do um in fact see if we had only pulled up the documentation we wouldn't have made this mistake oh wow um this is a <laughs> this is a great discovery we should fix this most definitely why are these no longer there um i thought they should still be in here um they should most certainly still be in the docs. Let's see. Yeah, okay. We should definitely file a bug and get this fixed. Um, this might be, oh yeah, we recently changed build systems um, and this might just be an artifact from that um, or you know some other breakage in our infrastructure here. Um, anyway, we don't need to necessarily look at the online version um, there might also be, sorry, here we were, there might also be an offline version or we can just use the perl.doc command that is mentioned here. So let's give that a shot and see if that works. Um, test cases lib. Oh yeah, I think we need to run this from the build directory and I think... So this is most definitely a change due to our build system change. Um, but now we have the perl.doc. Okay. So this looks nicer in your browser, but the browser version is kind of broken. So this will have to do. Um, and then let's see, we have the events for function that we were curious about and says helper function, which returns an array containing all events of the type red type, which was mode, which were generated by a three while subscribe CB was running. So the callback that I mentioned is not for when an event is received, it is for what should be triggering events. That's how this works. Are you aware of other WMs with a test suite? It seems quite uncommon. Um, I know that Openbox, I believe, has a very extensive test suite as well. Um, I haven't like audited other window managers for whether they have a test suite or not. I would not be surprised if a number of them do actually, but also I would not be surprised if a number of them don't. <laughs> Writing software without a test suite is madness. Yes, absolutely. Um, I tried to explain earlier why I think the same thing, but yeah, fully agreed. All right, um, so what this test does is it's sending mode M1 and then it's verifying that mode M1 resulted in an M1 mode change. So this is exactly, um, well, not exactly what we want to extend. Um, the What we are looking for, if we go back to the GitHub issue, is um, the get binding modes command should be extended. Really cool, tried to write a window manager many years ago and it was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the, the key is to stick with it for long enough that it becomes usable and useful. And then if you use it yourself, you're intrinsically motivated to fix all of the remaining breakage uh, to a certain extent. And then, you know, maybe that works. Um, but yeah, for sure, it is definitely, it has taken many, many years of my life. Testing GUI is pretty painful though. Don't know of a good way to do it. Yeah, uh, luckily a window manager is really not much about GUI. Uh, you know, th the fact that there are windows in like the spaces that the window manager manages is sort of a, a side effect that's not particularly interesting. In fact, many of our tests don't even create windows, they just create placeholders. Uh, and we are verifying everything by looking at the state of i3 via the IPC interface. Uh, let me actually illustrate this. So there is the i3 message program, which you can use to send IPC requests to i3. Um, let me see, yeah, we have the man page, nice. So um, in here we can send a type and one of the types that might be illustrative is get tree. Now, this might look very overwhelming, like a huge blob of JSON, screens full. But if you pipe it to JQ, uh, which is a nice little JSON processing tool, um, it actually becomes readable. And what you can see here is the entire layout tree of the i3 instance that I'm currently running. Uh, so everything is in there. Everything that influences anything is in there and can be tested. And that is very easy to test. Like there's no, there's no GUI involved. We don't actually look at any pixels. We don't look at graphics. We don't look at drawing instructions or anything like that. That part, you know, it's pretty well tested already because you can see it all the time when you're using the program. Um, but the things that are hard to test is behaviors. Uh, and that's why we can programmatically trigger all of them and uh, inspect state before and after all of them and subscribe to any changes, etc. So um, i3 is very well um, testable like that. Split the logic slash rendering, absolutely, yeah. Um, you can see the split in the source code as well. Um, we really do have like 
uh, a separate file that just is concerned with uh, mapping the internal i3 state onto x11. Um, so if we go to source x.c, that is where that's happening. And I think there is like um, a render function of sorts. Yeah, like all of this code is just here to, to map one thing to the other. And the rest of i3 is largely not concerned um, directly with uh, like, okay, let me phrase this more strongly. The rest of i3 does not ever send uh, requests to x11 at all. So uh, the logic is very clearly separated in you know anything that touches x11, um, that is the boundary here. Cool. Um, all right, so now we actually mentioned there's a get binding modes request. We could totally uh, run this. Let's see, uh, let's go back to the man page. Get binding modes, i3 message, dash t, get binding modes. And we get back this JSON array here, which you can actually read, um, which says volume and default. If you remember, I mentioned that volume is the one that I have configured in my i3 config. Um, and default is the one that always exists. Okay. Um, So let's just search for binding and see if we can actually find a test that does the get binding mode command. Um, there must be at least one because all of the IPC is tested. Um, maybe we can find the simplest one and then go from here. Oh, or maybe there isn't one actually. Well, we'll see. Um, we have a, like a very basic IPC test. Um, does i3 also work with Wayland? No, it does not. Um, it is like, despite the split of the logic and, and state transformation to x11, um, that split is actually not enough to, to work uh, with Wayland. Like the model is too different. There's Sway. Yes, that's correct. Sway is a third party implementation um, that behaves and looks a lot like i3. Um, it is to the extent that it is largely config file compatible. Um, and the commands are working the same and the IPC interface is working the same. Uh, in fact, the Go package that I mentioned earlier that um, allows you to talk to the IPC interface uh, works with i3 and with Sway. People are using it for Sway. All right, so let's see. So we have the get binding modes and I think there should be a corresponding definition in here somewhere. Yeah, type get binding modes. So because of the fact that we use, um, like despite the fact that we have the test suite and I, I tried to explain how it should be encouraging and helpful, uh, sometimes people just find it too cumbersome and or maybe sometimes people just don't realize and then a pull request gets accepted regardless. So it might actually be that um, for this particular subcommand, there might not be a specific test right now, which would be surprising, but in that case, we can just add one and then we've done two good things today on stream. Um, so let's actually just grab the entire source tree and see if this is used anywhere. And it looks like really the answer is no. Um, it's used in i3message where we've just used it on the command line and it is defined here, but it's never actually called from Perl code. So yeah, um, we get to add a new test. For this, there is actually a helper file called uh, test cases new test. Um, just gonna call it get binding modes. Oh great. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see if it's the spaces. No, it's not. Wow. Um, this is gonna be like a deep yak stack today if we're gonna look at this. Um, why is this? Let's have a quick look and see if we can immediately spot the problem. And if not, we're gonna move on and create this manually by just cargo culting. Oh, so it's looking for the latest file and then it's calling base name and it says use of uninitialized value and substitution in base name. Wow, okay. Um, which, you know, I would think, let's see. Okay, so maybe the latest file, I don't know if we have to say, uh, latest is, let's do it like this. Yeah, latest is not defined. And that is because, oh yeah, because it's looking for t slash. So this is sensitive to where we run it. So we must run it in the test cases directory, I think. Good binding modes. Yeah, 
Okay, so now we are in a new test where we can just start using this. Um, I don't like that it starts an editor for me right now. I'm going to use the one that I have on my other workspace. Okay, um, so we should probably um, do something about this later. Um, just going to make a to do here. I'm going to say, ah, right. Um, following doesn't work if run from, let's say, the test cases directory. And then we can deal with this later. All right, so test cases T. And then let's see, um, did it add the one? Oh, did we, were we supposed to save this and didn't? Oh, now we have two, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, I think it didn't show them here um, because this might still have been cached. Binding mode, oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so now we have a new test case. Um, we have the ticket number that we can just, excuse me, that we can just stuff in here. Um, description of this file verifies the get binding mode IPC command. Okay. Um, if you recall, these were dead links, some of them. We should totally fix them and or update the preamble, but we're going to do this out of band. Um, so one thing we should be able to do now is if we just compile it, it should be running all the tests. Okay, and everything should be passing. So if we look at the full test log, um, it doesn't print a list of all of the tests that it runs, though that should be in here. Um, let's see, latest complete run.log, yeah. And then if we search for 311 get binding modes, we can see that is being started, but the output is just empty because we don't have any test instructions in this test yet. Um, so this is where we could add things. We could say, um, um, let's see, I think there is like a not okay keyword and an okay keyword and it accepts like a Boolean value. Yeah, so if we just did okay and then anything that is falsy and say test failure and run these tests again, only that one test should not fail. And then we can, um, yeah, there we go. Oh, it's, oh, the other one times out it says, this might be a consequence of this one failing. Not entirely sure. Um, let's see, go back to build. Latest complete run. Yes, we read it. 312? No, 311. Oh yeah, no, the other one bails out first. Okay, so we're just gonna, I think we're just gonna narrow this down now to just complete run.pl. I think we need to explicitly run pl because it's not actually executable um, now that we switch to Mason. And then we're gonna say 311 get binding modes.t. See if this works. Yeah, nice. Okay. So now we have the expected test failure here. Um, and we can we can start. So this is sort of how you verify that everything is set up correctly, right? This is like the hello world of a test suite. You start by writing a failing test. And if it doesn't fail, then something's wrong. Um, and once it fails, you can actually continue and then get it to pass. Cool. Um, so uh, let's approach this um, the way somebody who is not familiar with the code would do, right? So we have a couple of commands here. Um, so tree, for example. Tree, for sure, uh, is used throughout the test suite. And I think there should be like, um, yeah, we just have a couple of compare tree instructions here. Maybe tree is not the best example. Maybe we need another command. Um, I think tick is one that I introduced where I'm relatively certain that I did have like at least one test. Uh, let me see. Source IPC, tick. Oh, but the, oh yeah, this is both a command and a and an event. 
st unsync st key. You know, this is not it. Interesting. So maybe um, maybe I'm just really bad at picking examples here because nothing uh, seems to actually be tested properly. What a disappointment. Um, this is the one that we want. There is the config one. Huh. Um, and the version one. What are you making? Um, I'm working on the i3 tiling window manager, which this is its website. Um, you can get a link by exclamation point i3 in the chat if you want to. Um, this is a, a window manager and specifically what we're doing is uh, in the window manager, you can switch between different modes of key bindings, but you cannot currently get which mode is active programmatically. Um, but people would like to do this to display it in the status bar. Um, so we're gonna introduce a way um, to make it possible. All right, um, let's see, version. Uh, IPC version, very nice. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> wow, yeah, this might be, uh, this is kind of what I'm looking for and also maybe an explanation for why we didn't find the others earlier. So uh, what this test does here is it explicitly opens a connection to i3 and then sends it a message and it's not using the um, i3 test um, Perl module um, because it wants to send a message for which there's like no uh, syntax, no syntactical sugar wrapper or no no convenience function wrapper in the i3 test library. Uh, if we pull this up, i3 test.pm.in, um, we can see we have a couple of them like cmd sync with i3. I think the, um, yeah, a couple of them are kind of advanced. Um, and then this one here, so if we go back to an event, yeah. So this is the numerical value of type get version, which is, it's kind of bad that we need to resort to this, um, but let's have a look and see if message in T, okay, this is the only place where we do it. And I thought these constants should actually be usable from here, but maybe I'm mistaken. Um, what tech are you using? Can you clarify this? Like in, in which aspect? Uh, maybe I've missed this, but why use Perl for the tests? Yeah, I explained this earlier. Um, we started with Perl like in 2009 and it is like a nice dynamic language. Um, it wasn't so unpopular at the time. Um, and now we have like over 3000 test instructions and so many tests that it is a nightmare to migrate anywhere else. Um, and it's not worth the very incremental benefit that we would get from a different language. Like Perl is okay for this. Cool, so we don't actually seem to use these properties anywhere else, and I don't want to bore you with too much Perl wrangling, so I'm just going to um, copy this for now and clean it up later. 2009, makes sense. Yeah, the world was a little bit different back then. All right, uh, this is the tree, but we are looking for the event. Wait, did I not have this? Oh, binding modes, yeah. Okay, nice. So um, I'm going to add a to-do here. Use the numeric, sorry, use the symbolic name for the reply type instead of the numerical eight. Oh, oh, this actually documents why this is happening. Sorry, I maybe should have been paying more attention to what's actually on screen. So the previous message actually explicitly sends the message without using uh, the version sugar method uh, because uh, in the i3.pm from any event, let me see, version, yeah, it has a fallback code path here and we didn't want this to trigger. So that's why we did it like that. But I think for the binding mode, yeah, there's just no wrapper for it. So we're gonna have to do it like this at first and then clean it up with these symbolic names later um, when we're more in the mood for wrangling Perl. All right, um, so there's a compare okay, which yeah, we still wanna, we still wanna keep that. Um, and what we're gonna say is just to get binding modes, we know this is a, an array, so this is what it would look like. And then what we want is 
I think we might need to do a deep compare of sorts. Yeah, there's an is deeply convenience function, and we want the binding modes to be just a default in this particular case. Um, on the default binding mode configured. All right, let's run it again, see what's happening. The structures begin differing at, um, have I, should I have used different syntax here? It sounds like this might be a syntax problem. But also it looks like it is roughly correct. Huh, let me see again. Oh, so this is nested somehow, it says, I think. Uh, let's actually dump this, let's see. I wonder if there's a way to convert Perl to Python, like how the Go compiler was converted from C to Go. Yeah, the tricky bit about D, about conversions like this, is that even the Go compiler, it was specifically written to be a certain type of code, like code that can easily be converted later on, and that only allowed them to actually do a source-to-source -source conversion, which also required some manual fixing later on. So it's never quite like, a full success, um, and it cannot be because at that time, like you spend too much effort in the conversion layer. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it could be migrated, but it's a lot of work, and the little uh, time that people are spending on i three, uh, I think we should not waste on efforts like that that are only like make it marginally better. I thought it went from idiomatic C to unidiomatic Go. No, it was actually kind of unidiomatic C ish, like Go looking C to then still unidiomatic go and then to proper go. Okay, um, I forget. I think diag is the um, function that we can use for diagnostics in the tests. So we're just gonna say binding modes and then we're gonna say uh, dumper add binding modes. Let's see what this prints, see what this is. Yeah, so this is somehow an array which contains an array. Um, Let's see, but it looks to be just one layer here. So that is a bit surprising. Maybe I'm assigning this wrong, or maybe maybe I should be getting an array ref like this. Maybe I should be doing that. Maybe that is it. Yeah. Um, all right. This passes. Okay, so you can see that I'm a, a little bit rustic in, in Perl here, um, but we can get it to work. Cool, um, so now we have verified that only the default binding mode is configured by default. Um, I think at this point, um, we will need to specify an i3 config. Um, we've, had, we've had one on screen earlier, I think uh, in the mode event tests, yeah. Can I just copy and paste this? Just gonna define one extra mode. Um, oh yeah, one thing that I didn't talk about is the nop foo. Uh, nop is a command that is a noop, but its output ends up in the log file. So you can use this whenever you wanna signal something. So for example, um, if I do i3 dump log dash f, um, it now enables transparently for me the debug logging, and whenever I do anything that has any effect, um, I get like the full log file here. And if I just say i3 message nop hello twitch, uh, let's see, we need to scroll up a little bit because the log is very, very chatty. Uh, yeah, we can see the hello twitch line here, um, <laughs> you know, with the with the little dashes here. Um, to make it more visible, though at that point that is like a long lost battle, I think. Um, yeah, in fact, like sometimes when I deal with these log files, uh, so they are very verbose um, intentionally because whenever we get a bug report, we need to have like all of the insight that we can get and we need to reconstruct state not only in a certain moment, but also how was the state earlier and how did it change? And the log file tries to really log everything that could result in a change. Actually, I just see that maybe I should turn on the light here to make this a little bit brighter. Um, and uh, yeah, so by default, it just dumps everything. And we did actually have configurable log levels. Like you could tell i3 that you're only interested in the render logs. 
But at some point, we dropped this concept altogether because it turned out that we only ever asked people for all of the logs um, because often it was like the, the render output looked fine, but if you looked at it in context, you could see that a preceding line had an effect on it or something like that. So it would always make sense to, whenever you're filtering, to always look at the things in context too. And if you drop them outright, you can't do that. So the way we do it now is uh, the log files just contain everything and then we filter them um, currently using grep, um, but it is totally possible to write something more advanced, but at the same time, it hasn't been necessary. So um, grep is okay for this. All right, um, so that's the knob command. Um, I suppose for this particular test, we don't even need to have any commands in this binding mode, though it also can't hurt. Eh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm undecided. I think I'm gonna leave it in, remove it later, and if the test still passes, then we don't need it after all. <laughs> All right, so now the test should fail. Yeah, because um, it's it's telling us the test, only the default binding has been configured, is failing now because we have an extra mode. Uh, so let's see, extra should be in here. Now it's passing again. This is good. Um, and now we wanna know which one is the current one. So for that, oh yeah. Oh, I, okay, I, I think I see what one one of the um, one of the issues is with extending this existing command um, because it currently just returns an array of strings and that doesn't lend itself well to be uh, extended right we would have uh, we would have to have a struct like this um, where we can add a new struct field and then that wouldn't break downstream users but if we change this here it would break downstream so we can't do this. so we do need to add a new command after all but it's no big deal we can do this it's just a little bit of plumbing. Um, so we will need to do that and then uh, the other items that we need to do is uh, switch to the extra mode, switch from default to the extra mode, um, verify default mode is what we use at startup uh, and then verify extra is what we get from the new command. So these are the rough steps that we have in front of us. Um, so now let's actually look at include i3 ipc.h. This is where canonically all of the IPC stuff is defined. So what we would need is a new message type. Uh, and this would be I think I'm gonna make this a like, little bit more generic than what was originally asked. Like originally it was just the binding mode name that is active, but I think you know, given that we will want to opt for a struct such as the one that I just had on screen for extensibility in the future, um, we might as well phrase it in the documentation so that people can understand that there's more than just a name in here, um, even though the name is gonna be the one and only property right now, but maybe not so much in the future. So this is i3 ipc message type um, get binding state would be the logical number and, and naming scheme for this. Everything that requests something from i3 is get and everything that tells it something to do is just the verb. So then we will also have a corresponding reply type. Reply type get binding state 12. Let's do a quick search to make sure there's no typos in here. And then no new event types. So this is this is the modification that we need to do here. Um, fairly simple. And then we have source ipc.c, um, where all of the IPC handlers are defined. So uh, we will need a new handler. Get how do we just call it? Get binding state. Uh, copy and paste this, and then handle sync is the latest handler, IPC handler, get binding state. Cool. And the one that I wanted to use, I think, as a blueprint is this one. It's very similar to what we want to send out. So this is reply type, get binding state. Um, and we will just have a name. And then this is where the name would go. The the binding, the currently active binding 
mode name. Yeah, so many terms. Hi there, do you think it would make it would have make sense to use something like protobufs if they existed in 2009 to ensure backwards compatibility with the IPC? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I like protobufs, I use them a lot uh, in different projects, but for this particular interface, uh, the compatibility guarantee that we have is that we only ever add to the interface and there has not been a need to ever remove anything from it. Um, so for this particular case where you don't have like, um, you know, it's it's very easy to um, to reason about this, right? Because if you have like a JSON thing, as long as you don't change the behavior of the existing JSON keys, software will be compatible. Uh, so yeah, I don't think protobuf has like a big advantage here, but maybe you were asking about some specific aspect. Um, let me know if so. Hello, Raiders, uh, welcome. Um, we're working on the i3 window manager um, and we're specifically, uh, we have this issue here to tackle where uh, we're adding a programmatic way to get the current binding mode through the IPC interface. So we're dealing with uh, the, the inter-process communication interface with the i3 window manager. Cool. Um, so this is here, this is the handler. I think this might already be everything we need in terms of plumbing in order to make this work. There might be uh, in the ipc.h, there might be a need to declare something. No, the handlers are not declared in here. So this should actually, this should actually maybe already work. Let's see. Um, I'm gonna go back to our test. And in here, uh, yeah, we, we will need this as well. So we might as well do it right now. Type get, I tried to mess with some tiling, some window tiling window manager, but didn't find one I liked. Huh, too bad. Um, it is a matter of preference for sure. Um, I'm not saying everybody should be using one, but there are people who enjoy it. Um, so let me see, uh, get binding state 12, and then that should be exported here as well. All right. Um, that should be all that we need here. So now we can use 12. It does make sense as long as the structure of the JSON doesn't change indeed. Yes. And that is the guarantee that we give. Um, also, one of the considerations was that the hurdle to starting to use the i3 IPC interface should be relatively small um, in the sense that, you know, within, let's say, an afternoon, you should be able to implement the whole thing, even if there wasn't a library already for your language, uh, at least in terms of sending a message to i3 and getting something back. And I think that is very achievable. Um, that also means that if you had to start out by pulling in protobuf as a dependency, you know, maybe that makes things a little bit hard. Um, and depending on the language that you wanted to use, maybe availability isn't so good. Um, there are a couple of considerations like that that went into the, the choice. Cool. So um, binding modes will be binding state. This should now be a struct. Um, we can just say, okay, zero state equals dumper binding state. Um, Adding protobufs is a different story. Oh yeah. Um, and then let's go to our build directory and just do another full rebuild. Oh, handle get binding state undeclared um, because we don't have a forward declaration, but where are they? No, wait, we must be missing something else. So let me see. Um, just do the compilation in here so that we can jump around back and forth. Uh, 1373. Oh, we have an extra handle here. So the concatenation didn't work anymore. Cool. Um, name to do. Very nice. So what we're now seeing is uh, the output of these two lines here. So the Y macros here are from the um, yet another JSON library library that we use to produce JSON. Um, and we can see that struct represented now in our Perl test uh, as name is to do. So um, let's actually look into the commands. And I think there should be a command mode, which goes into switch mode. Oh, interesting. Um, I think I haven't set up my working copy correctly yet because the compile commands.json should be linked from the root. Um, 
Yeah, nice. So now we can switch back and forth. Um, so if you don't know about this, um, any software that uses Mason, the build system, or CMake, if you use CMake with the Ninja generator, will by default uh, produce in its build directory a uh, compile commands.json, which is a programmatic representation of like all of the different files that went into your build. Uh, so this is what the language servers then use uh, to provide uh, features to your editors, um, such as Emacs here. Um, so now if I have my cursor over switch mode, I can just say, oh yeah, um, I just want to switch into that. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, it shows me the um, documentation of this function, which is nice, and the signature of it. Um, so now we can more conveniently navigate this code. It's very simple to activate, you know, just link the uh, build directories, compile commands.json into your source directory, and you are done. All right, um, switching to this mode, and then it goes through the modes, and if it finds the mode, it actually switches to them. Um, let's see where we actually store this. So we have the uh, bindings equals mode bindings. So I think bindings is like a global that we update here like that. Uh, mode name, new mode. Where do we update the mode or do we even actually? It might be that we just don't store this at all. Um, it looks like we're constructing this event here and we're just sending it out and then, you know, the, the new mode here, yeah, the, the highlight shows it's only used here to actually find the mode, but then we're not actually storing it. Interesting. Um, so let's take a look at where we could conceivably store this. I think we already have like a configuration.h where um, we have the rest of our config. And I think the modes should be in there somewhere mode binding modes must have skipped it strike mode yeah yep interesting um yeah i wasn't i wasn't aware before i started here that um, it would just throw the mode away like that one more thing to add can't actually see it here though let me see where modes head is used um, we're using these weird S-list macros here. These are all from uh, q.h, which, um, sorry. Uh, this is like a BSD um, header file where they define all sorts of lists like linked list, uh, doubly linked lists, circular lists. Um, we have gotten into the habit of using this um, from back when I was still using NetBSD um, when I developed this briefly. Um, it, is a, it is a useful header. Cheers, hey, welcome to the stream. Um, but yeah, it is kind of a shame that like all of these data structures you need to do yourself in C, um, and that's why every C code base looks a little bit different. Let's see if we actually use this anywhere. It might not be. Oh yeah, this is the where the storage is defined for this. Okay, and then we have the config here. Config is struct config, which is defined here. It has a font and a whole bunch of other properties. Um, let's see where we actually define the bindings. It might be good to just do it adjacent to that location. This is the usage. Oh, the bindings are part of the config, okay. And then let's see what a binding T is. But then where are they keyed by mode? Wait, this is still not making like total sense. We had it open here, right? Sorry, let me close all of these. All right. Uh, Oh, this is, oh, sorry. I, yeah, now I see why I got confused here. So this is i3 bars configuration, um, and it doesn't have the concept of modes. Um, so that happens when you jump th through the code too quickly. Um, sorry about that. So uh, bindings, i3 source. I think that is what we want to look at. And then, oh yeah. Oh, wow, it's even in main actually. All right. So one thing we could do is const char current binding mode 
uh, it will be initialized to zero. No, it will not be. Um, it would be if it was static, but it isn't because we actually explicitly want this to be visible in other uh, compilation units as well. Um, all right, so current binding mode um, in the commands.c when we are in switch mode, switch mode is the function that needs to update this. So when it changes the bindings, it should also say current binding mode is and we probably, wait, we don't necessarily need to copy this if we just point it to mode name, uh, because that like that is permanently defined anyway. Um, this is one of the things, check that reloading config works, memory management wise. Man, mem manual memory management is so tedious. Um, it's one of the things that I don't miss at all. Um, when not using C. Um, I suppose we could also copy it if that makes things easier, but let's try this for now. Um, and let's see, so uh, struct bindings head, where do we export this in the includes? In here, but that's not the one I mean. Do you have a beard? Yes. Can you see it? <laughs> um, Let's see. So this needs access to that. Uh, auto starts. I was thinking, is that a mask pull down or connected to neither? <laughs> it is in here. Oh yeah, include i3. That is the one that is responsible for main and is, oh yeah, that's where bindings is. So we would just, about memory management, what do you use to check against memory leaks and related nightmares? We used to use Valgrind for a while. Uh, these days we use Address Sanitizer, which we have enabled by default for debug builds. Um, that's very nice. It has a little bit of a slowdown, of course, um, but it's, you know, it, it's okay. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the kind of issues that it exposes is totally worth the slowdown that it imposes. So, uh, but yeah, it's you know even even though we're using address sanitizer and leak sanitizer, some of the things still uh, slip through the cracks, and then we just get bugs about them and need to fix them. That is just a reality in C, unfortunately. Okay, so um, one of the things that we still need to take a deeper look at in the bindings. Modes, this is here. This is where we define it. Um, it's using a mode and that's this one here. So what I now want to find out is um, there should be a default mode, I think, and we should probably be instantiating this just before, yeah, exactly, this is where we do it. So when we do a load configuration, we initialize the S list, a singly linked list with the Q macros that I mentioned earlier. And this is the default mode. So it has a name and that's allocated here very early on. And then bindings is set here, that's good. So now we need to set the current binding mode to be default mode name. So now the pointer is initialized here. Um, we never free current binding mode and we don't need to. We just need to ensure that it points to a valid thing at all times. But I think whenever we reload the configuration, load configuration is run and then that always starts from here. So that's why the default mode is always the same. Um, and we start out with the pointer being correct. Uh, so this should be good. So we can just remove this to do here. Uh, let me see if this builds. Um, you can also see that i3 builds very quickly. Could be building a little bit more quickly if we had better header hygiene. Currently, we just include all of the things from all of the files. Um, but it builds quickly enough that you can use this in an iterative um, work style. All right, um, so this builds, which is good. So now let's go back to the IPC and actually just dump this in here instead of the to-do. And then if we rerun the test, um, oh, we should also rerun recompile and then rerun the test. Name default, very nice.
Okay. Um, so now let's get back to our pull test and see if we can actually uh, prepare okay binding state name should be default um, at startup binding mode is default and then whoops uh, this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Yeah, see, this is the downside for uh, domain-specific languages. When there's all sorts of identifiers in your namespace and you never need to qualify which one is where, you don't develop a feeling of which one comes from where and what ones are available and where you would look at in order to find other ones. So I'm a big friend of how Go does it in terms of namespacing, where you need to qualify all the things. I mean, sure, you can dot import, but it's bad style. Um, but that really helps with sort of establishing a model of what lives where and what you can find where. So I would totally prefer that instead of polluting the global namespace like C does by default. All right, default mode is what we use at startup. We have implemented this. Then let's say mode extra is the command we send. Uh, and then if we query this again, we should be getting extra, not default. So after switching, binding mode is extra. There we go, nice. So we have implemented a test for it. Um, let's see if our change makes sense overall. And also if you have questions about this, now is a good time. Oh yeah, so uh, the test we'll need to add to our staging area. Um, oh yeah, of course, the, the whole documentation thing. So um, docs IPC, this is where we would add a new uh, command. Uh, this would be get binding state. Uh, get binding, oh, binding state reply for consistency. Binding state. That is the human readable title. And then in the ipc.h, okay. Um, and then we also need to document the reply. So that is kind of like here. Uh, get binding state 12 apply to the get binding state message and then we actually talk about this in more detail further down uh, specifically config take sync this is where it needs to go get binding state apply um, and it needs to have the permalink. All right, so uh, this can be a quick example. So this would just be name, and then this would be default. The binding state reply is a map with which currently only contains the name member, which is a string containing, well, which is the name of the currently active binding mode as a string. All right. Um, so this is also here. Um, if we wanted to go like, um, I think, Oh yeah, there's a dash dash reconfigure. Yeah, there we go. So if we now also build all of the docs, a string, not a string. That's a string. Thank you very much. 
Cool. Um, so now we have uh, the new version of the IPC document here. Uh, let's just open this up. You can see it's rendered a little bit differently, but it is the same document. So we have the get binding state reply um, with the documented name default. Um, and in the sending messages, get binding state is listed here in the table. If we click here, we get there. So everything seems to be working correctly. Uh, no dark mode. <laughs> yeah, um, the dark mode is only when you look at this online. Um, locally, so the way this works is online, it pulls in the i3wm.org CSS file. Um, in the local builds of the documentation, we don't do this um, for privacy reasons, so that you don't send a request every time you open the i3 docs. This is actually um, a thing that Debian policy wants packages to do. Um, and I think it's a sensible request. All right, um, can disable the docs again for speed. Um, now let's see, okay, so now um, actually, um, I have like a, a nice scene uh, configured here uh, in OBS for, for Maggot, um, because I'm gonna be using Maggot throughout this. Um, I have already used it without saying a word about it, but I figured now that we are getting into the state where uh, we wanna deal with Git to actually push out our changes, it makes sense to talk a little bit about it. Um, so for those of you, um, <laughs> I was being funny, but that was good to know, yeah. <laughs> um, for those of you who uh, are not familiar yet with Maggot, it is a, it is, you know, they describe it as a Git porcelain inside Emacs. And a Git porcelain just means that it covers all of Git and you can do everything that Git can do um, via this. So porcelain is like a word for user interface kind of in Git. Like there might be a nuance to it, but this is basically what it means. Um, and like um, when I was putting together uh, the screen earlier today, um, I was actually surprised at the shade they're throwing onto other UIs because in the last sentence of the left-hand side, they say, while many fine Git clients exist, only Maggot and Git itself deserve to be called porcelains. Um, and there is some truth to it. Like the Maggot integration is really, really deep. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side um, in, the, in the screenshot um, how it typically looks like. Um, so why don't we actually uh, switch back um, to my desktop and then I can show you what it looks like in action for this particular project. Um, I think um, I think I might not be running screen key. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so screen key is what I use to show um, on screen what I'm typing. Um, actually, let's keep this open as it is. So um, let's walk through what we're doing here. Um, we are seeing the Maggot uh, view of our source tree right here. So we can see we've modified a couple of files. Um, the any event code um, that is the interface to i3 that we're using in the test cases so that we can write the test. Um, the test, which by the way, um, we should now stage. So I'm pressing S for stage. Um, you can see that uh, in the stage, if we expand this using tab, we can now see the full diff of what we've done in this test. Um, there are also jump commands like ju for jump to unstaged and js for jump to staged. Um, but I am in the habit of just using my arrow keys. Um, maybe on stream, I'm going to do the js so it's cleaner in the screen key. Anyway, um, so then here, uh, if we press 4, we can expand all of these or 2 to collapse all of them. Um, I am usually looking through them in the for view so that I can just scroll through my entire commit. In this case, we would see that the to do that we added here earlier, um, we wouldn't want to stage this. Um, there's multiple ways of accomplishing this. So we can say jump to unstage, collapse all. We could say only take these changes, just select them, press S for stage, and then we can see they have all been staged, but the new test change that we didn't want to stage has not been staged. Another way of doing this is we can just say unstage all of the things, um, just stage everything, stage the unchecked file too, and then uh, just unstage the one that we didn't want to have. Um, kind of a matter of preference, but yeah, there's multiple ways to do the same thing. All right, um, so now we can see that our head is next. Um, in the i3 development, we have a branch model where master is always stable and contains the last stable release plus any bug fixes that have been backported and next contains what goes into the next release. Um, so that's where development happens. That's sort of the default branch. 
how is this better than VS Code's version control tab? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily better. Um, I can use this very quickly, and I haven't gotten uh, along well with the VS Code version control tab, though I haven't used it much at all. Um, I just haven't used VS Code much at all, I have to say. Um, maybe you know, maybe it is as good. I'm, I'm not saying that you must use Magad or that it is definitely better than everything else, um, but I do like using it, and it is by far the favorite Git user interface that I have ever used. Um, do you use Emacs for Go too? I do. Um, you can check out my other screen recordings if you want to see me use uh, Emacs for Go, um, or you know maybe stick around for later if we get around to this. Um, thank you, Misty Emoji. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> um, fair enough. I have the tendency to reply in earnest. Um, all right. Um, so let's continue here. So I pressed CC for commit all of the stage changes. Now it opens this sort of split pane mode here. Uh, it tells me how to proceed. It tells me type Control C, Control C to finish, um, Control C, Control K to cancel, and Meta P and N to recover older messages. Which is actually this is quite cool. Um, I don't have any older messages here, so uh, this doesn't work. We'll use Emacs for go to too. Haha! <laughs> this time I'm not replying. <laughs> um, and on the right hand side, we can see all of the changes. Um, so we've already looked through them, so we don't necessarily need to spend too much time in here but it is nice to see them all again. And now we can come up with a good commit message. So we can say, uh, introduce get binding state IPC command. And we can say fixes this particular GitHub issue. Um, we say control C, control C to actually commit it. Um, oh yeah, and now I um, actually made a mistake. So this is why I was talking to you about uh, the master branch and the next branch earlier, because now I actually want to spin off a branch, but it's no problem in Magad actually. So I just press B S for branch spin off. And I'm going to say um, binding state is the name for my branch. And now you can see that we are now on a branch called binding state. Um, we still have the unstaged change here that has been carried over. But if we press LL to look at the log, we can see that the commit we just did is actually in here. And it is the head of binding state. Um, Let's actually restore the window config. Um, and if we press BB to switch back to the next branch, we can see that it is no longer in the next branch. So the spin-off of uh, my change into the branch has actually resulted in the next branch remaining untouched and me having a new branch that I can now push upstream um, and suggest a pull request. You mentioned on Twitter about documenting your stream setup. I am assuming you will include your stream-specific i3 setup as well. Yes. Um, I totally can, though it is really very, very simple. Um, actually, let me go to config files, git diff, let me turn this off. Uh, config i3 config. Um, oh yeah, so these are funny. Um, these clash with OBS key bindings, uh, so I define them as nops. Uh, you've learned earlier what a nop does, it just prints into the log, but has no other effects than that. Um, I have changed the font of the i3 bar, I've changed it to hide, and I've changed default border to be one pixel. Um, so that, as you can see, like there's no title bar, but as soon as there are multiple windows and it becomes ambiguous what is going on, there is a title bar. That is really all that I have done um, to modify my i3 setup here. Um, one, other things that I, one other thing that I'm going to plug into my i3 config is starting screen key, which you've just seen me start manually here. I'm just going to make it so that it's always started when i3 is started, so that it's part of the session. Um, but yeah, um, I can definitely talk a little bit more about how I'm using OBS and doing these streams. Um, the setup that I was referring to on Twitter earlier is specifically for the co-programming that I'm doing with Matt Layer from time to time, um, where we have been working on a GStreamer based setup that is using WebRTC under the covers, or at least the same technology building blocks that WebRTC is built on, meaning RTP streams and such, um, to do very low latency streaming of my OBS output uh, over to Matt and Matt's OBS output over to me so that we can then plug the outputs of each other as an input into our stream. And that way, like have one person drive and share their screen and have the other person still be able to comment. And on the stream that you're watching, you can see everything happening. So this should be much better than the multi-stream that we were using in our first pair programming stream. Um, and I'm very excited to, to actually give this a shot. We've tested it earlier today and it looked very promising, like no artifacts or glitches or anything like that. Um, and it's like, yeah, 
Very neat. Would love to contribute if you have that in a repo somewhere. Uh, for sure. Um, send me a Twitter direct message, please, with your GitHub username, and I will add you as a collaborator to the uh, draft repository that I have. Um, and I'm working on making that repository public over the coming week. Um, but I, I can't promise like any launch date or something like that. Um, and it's going to be like a little bit rough around the edges, but um, I think this should have everything in terms of documentation to get you going if you're interested in this. So yeah, um, exciting. Um, looking forward to to working on this um, with other people as well, especially if they have uh, the skills to uh, correct my GStreamer invocations. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we have now uh, done like everything that we wanted to do locally. So it is time to, okay, let me turn on the uh, screen keys again. It's time to push um, and then we're going to choose um, push binding state to Stapleberg slash binding state, creating it. Um, so the push remote is set to my own branch of i3 or my own fork of i3 rather on GitHub. Um, and if I just press PP, um, it will push to the push remote and that will create the new branch. We can see it now finished. Um, so now if I open this up and I click on i3 here, uh, I see the compare and pull request. And we can take a look here as like the final sanity check. Um, oh, sorry, now it works again. Uh, for the changes that we did, oh, so see, we actually have an issue here um, and we will, uh, we will be notified of this, um, I think in two ways actually. So if we go to my fork, we can see um, if we change branch to binding state, uh, click commits, we can see on the latest commit our CI is running and the CI will complain because our code is not actually formatted using Clang format um, because for example, of this white space issue that we have here, um, we can now choose to either fix this manually um, or fix it using Clang format. Um, ideally, we would fix it by setting up Clang format to be automatically, uh, to automatically run in our editor, but I don't have that set up in the stream setup yet. So I'm gonna do this later. Gonna hit the bed, good luck with the work. Yeah, uh, thanks for hanging out and have a good night. Um, all right, so one thing we can do, um, and I think there was like, I think there was like, um, yeah, like a, an, an Arch user repository package that I installed earlier that gives you like all of the different versions of Clang format in a static build. So we can use exactly the right version of Clang format to format our source code with. Um, this is less of a problem in Go typically because they change formatting less frequently. It's not so much of a problem with uh, C code anymore with client format, I think also because the rate of changes has slowed down. But for a while it was really relevant which particular version of client format you would be using so that you would format the code the same that our CI would format the code and the rest of our developers would format the code. And I think it was still at the time when Clang was like stuck on version three um, before they adopted like the more loose versioning scheme. Um, and they had like, uh, I think it was a difference between client format 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, all behaving differently or something along these lines. Um, so I have learned to like pay attention to uh, which client format we're using. Um, all right, so uh, let's see where the issue was. Source bindings.c. So we're gonna say source bindings.c. Um, oh yeah, we should do this from the i3 tree, of course. Uh, source bindings.c. And now we should see a change. Yeah, the white space change is now here. Um, so let's go back to Maggot. Um, here, this is a bit unfortunate, right? Like the two lines look exactly identical. Um, I wonder, yeah, if I turn on white space mode, I can actually see it here. Um, so white space mode is not a Maggot feature, it's an Emacs feature, but it seems to compose nicely here. So it works also in Maggot. And we can see here that there's like a single tab and then there's spaces. And we do use the spaces in i3. Um, and for backline format. So that is the change that we wanted to make. So I'm gonna say S for stage. I'm gonna say C for commit, A for amend, control C, control C for acknowledge the commit message, P dash F for force push, P to uh, push remote, and that way update the pull request. Uh, quite a mouthful, but uh, these sort of uh, sequences or courts um, are gonna become more natural as you continue to use Maggot. Cool, so now this looks better. Um, if there's anything else wrong with the pull request, RCI will tell us. But I think for now we can just say, create pull request. 
nice. Um, yeah, the Travis run here uh, should eventually succeed. We're not going to wait for it because it's going to take a couple minutes. So we're going to do something else in the meantime um, and then come back here and see if it needs fixing later on. Um, this we can close, close. Um, this one here, if we reload it, should now at the very end reference the pull request we just opened. Yep. Um, the more I think about it, the more I prefer separate requests. This is exactly what we did. We introduced a separate request. Merge gaps in the meantime, huh? Um, I3 development is not that active. That that would be a problem. <laughs> um, yeah, these days it's mostly um, Orestes and I um, and like a couple of other uh, random people working on random things. But in terms of core contributors, um, Orestes has done a lot of really good work. Um, and Ingo also has done a lot of really good work, um, but he's not active currently. Um, so I suppose Orestes will at some point have a look at this pull request um, and then approve it. Cool. Um, any questions up until here? Cool. Um, so we have already done this. Uh, you can see there's now pull recaps for this. Um, oh yeah, so there is um, there's one like sort of more technical issue that I was uh, referring to earlier, which uh, might be nice to fix, um, but I'm not sure if time permits. Maybe we can at least get started. Um, and then there's one other thing which might be a little bit more fun and a little bit more varied and a little bit more practical, um, which is um, there is a Go package to talk to i3. Um, and while it's not exactly working on i3, it is working with i3. So I think it qualifies for an i3 stream to do something with it. And one of the things that I wanted to do is um, when you have multiple uh, windows open like this, um, oops, um, i3 test cases. Um, and then let's say you have like many of them, right? And they are in, in different working directories and the titles become longer and the titles become meaningful. And maybe you want to like copy this out and sure you can copy it from here, but sometimes it would be nice to do copy and paste of window titles. So I wanted to have a look at how we could actually do this um, in the uh, configuration and IPC interface um, and maybe configure like a mouse click handler so that if we click the title bar, it would automatically copy to clipboard. Um, this might be a nice little hack um, with which I can show you around how you would go about developing something like this. Would you write i3 and go if you were starting the project today? Probably yes. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't make sense to rewrite anything, which is why you were asking like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, with all of the things that I've learned in Go, um, and how it fares in comparison to C in general, I think it would be a much better choice for a project like this today, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, the situation looked different at the time though. Um, you know, Go was, um, not publicly released at the time when I started working on i3. Um, and just in general, like the level of support and standing that Go has today uh, would not be equivalent to where C was back at the time. Like, you know, any library in C or any sort of example code or any other component of the X11 stack was all written in C. So if you were using C, you were sort of on the main path. Everything was well thought out. Um, everything worked. Um, in Go, you would always be the odd case and you would be the person who would need to make everything work. Um, so you need to spend like a lot of time overcoming a lot of hurdles um, if you're doing something that is weird for the ecosystem that you're working in. And at the time, doing X11 things from Go was certainly weird. Um, nowadays, I think it's a lot more common. And I think um, there are actually window managers that are written in Go for X11. Um, so I think it would both be feasible and a good idea. All right. Um, so there are a couple of things that um, we should have a look at Um Specifically, um, let's start with the user guide because that's where people should start, right? Um, we need a couple of building blocks to put this feature together. So um, as a quick reminder, we wanted to like copy and paste out window titles when we click on them. So how do we accomplish anything after a click? There's mouse bindings in i3, um, which are very similar to key bindings. Um, though what you bind is like a button one for left mouse button and then button two and three for like right mouse button, middle mouse button. Uh, if you have one of these mice with like lots of buttons on the sides, um, you can go very high up uh, and like declare actions for all of these if you so choose. Um, so uh, here we're going to switch back to the next branch um, so that we have like a clean slate again and 
Uh, the change that we just did is now off to the side. Um, I can take a quick look. We have like a lot of different buffers open. Um, we could clean a couple of them up. It doesn't really matter. Like in terms of Emacs performance, it doesn't matter. But um, in terms of cleanliness, um, you know, maybe it's good to close a couple of these <laughs> um, so that we can navigate Emacs better. All right. Um, what we will start out with is config i3 config. Um, and we want to just, so I'm, I'm just going to like demonstrate and try this out in uh, this configuration for the stream, right? Um, no risk, no fun. So um, we want to do a bind sim, bind sim button one. Yeah, this is all scoped to over title bars, I think, uh, by default. You can scope it also to the whole window and even exclude the title bar. Um, so these are like all the different scoping options, but by default it is, uh, let's see, pressing a specific mouse button in the scope of the click container will run only when you click on the title bar of the window. Yeah, that is what we want. Um, and the release flag allows us to run when the mouse button is released, which is sort of a nice semantic in that sense. Um, in terms of, you know, if, you, if, if I was doing a click like this and I'm holding my mouse button, I don't expect things to happen as soon as I've clicked. I expect things to happen as soon as I release. Um, so if I were to like click on a title bar and then double think about whether it is okay to like copy and paste right now, um, I would have the option theoretically to abandon this click by like maybe pressing escape. Um, I don't think that works right now. So this is just spitballing, but in principle, I think it is better to uh, trigger upon release instead of triggering upon push. Uh, for things such as this particular feature. So we're going to do bind sim dash dash release button one, nop button one, clicked on title bar. Um, and then I'm going to set my compile command in Emacs to i3 reload. Um, so now we can see that it has reloaded my config file. Um, so now I should be able to observe in the log when I'm clicking um, i3 dump log when I'm clicking on a title bar. So let's see. Yeah, there we go. So on the left hand side, you can see button one clicked on title bar. Um, and this happens as I click on the title bar. So this is exactly what we want to see. Um, Alrighty, so the next step is to sort of get the currently focused window or uh, the window whose title you're clicking on actually, and that might actually be a little bit tricky. Um, because while while we have command criteria, um, these would be for triggering the command itself. And in the command itself, we can't actually reference uh, the things that we can use in criteria to match, I think. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate. So maybe the next best thing is the currently focused window. And this is where um, the IPC comes in. Um, so now would be the point where, uh, let's see, uh, we would probably create a new repository or something like, um, copy title for i3. Um, I have the habit of um, calling all of these repositories something ending in 4i3 so that it is clear that it is third party, um, but also what it is made for. Copy title. All right. Um, cool. So where were we? Um, copy title. Yeah. Let's say go run copy title. Um, this runs and it does nothing as expected. So now we can actually start using the i3 package that we had on screen earlier, um, where um, there should be, there's a get tree, there's an example for it. And then there is the find focused, um, which finds the currently focused workspace. Um, and then we can iterate further using find child. And I think there's also a find focus child. Um, all of this should be keyed off of the tree's root. So we can look at the node, there is a find child and find focused and has a predicate. And I think if we specify nil as the predicate, um, does it say? 
I think it should say maybe, but let's quickly see. Oh, it just calls the predicate. So we should actually specify a predicate, but maybe we just never um, return false so that we actually traverse all the way down and find the focused window. Um, so let's go back to the example and use this as a starting point. Uh, this is actually a lengthy example. I think we only need this particular bit and then we're gonna modify this anyway. Okay, I'm gonna do a go get and then um, import the import path for this command. Uh, this is the module. All right, oh, um, actually, sorry. Um, go mode in it, uh, copy title four by three. Um, I was not using module mode before, and now I am, and now everything should just magically work. Yeah, very nice. Okay, a couple dependencies, now all done. So if we now, um, let's see, uh, this should be the import path. Yeah, it keeps it, and if we do, well, uh, workspace, if we run this again, yeah, uh, we get to currently select a workspace, which is one that is expected, you know, a couple of IDs, which are really just pointer values, a um, couple of other things. Um, this is all not formatted so nicely because the struct uh, keys are missing here um, because I'm just using percent %V instead of percent plus %V or something like that, more lengthy. But I just wanted to do a quick check of what we get here. Um, so now let's see what happens if we do return false. Um, oh, it says could not could not return actually. So this is not great. Um, so we do say, okay, so how do we do this? Let's see if there is a predicate that can help us or if we just need to come up with um, our own one. Uh, focused. Ah, right, so find focused iterates in focus order. Um, and if it can't iterate anymore, it will return nil, which is why we're getting the nil. Oh, so maybe the predicate would need to be that there's no more children so that we are dealing with a leaf node. Um, that might be, that might be our predicate. Um, and I would just be checking if nodes and floating nodes are both empty. Um, yeah, maybe we add like a shorthand for this to the package at some point. Okay, so um, if this length is zero and if the length of... So this is uh, end.nodes is tiling nodes and floating nodes is obviously floating nodes. So if both of them are uh, if both of them are empty, then there's no more uh, no more children underneath this, which means it's a leaf. So I'm gonna locate leaf container. Uh, should be a leaf, of course. Yeah, nice. Okay, so now we get the emacs window. Um, this is what we expect. All right. Um, now we can make this a little bit more verbose. Um, we have a name. And I think the name is actually, I don't think there is, yeah, there's window properties title. That is cleaner to use than the name um, because I think it can be, or wait, actually, I think if people want to override the name, it should probably copy whatever is actually in the title bar. So the name would probably be more correct. So name it is after all. Um, well, that, that's not. Very helpful. Okay, so we have the name. I think the next step is to just actually plug it into Xclip, um, which, um, let's see, if you haven't used it before, um, Xclip is a little command line tool that you can feed data from standard in or from files. And it then makes the data available as an X selection so that you can copy and paste. So if I do something like echo hello twitch type Xclip, and then I copy and paste it here, or I paste here, um, we can see that it had copied this to the clipboard. Um, this includes the trailing new line, so um, we need to pay attention to this. 
All right, um, so xclip is what it should go into and standard in is how it's gonna get there. Um, so at this point, um, we're gonna say um, xclip is the command we wanna run. Um, the xclip standard in is gonna be strings.new reader from string leaf.name. Um, xclip standard out is gonna be passed through to the os.standard out and xclip standard error is also passed through. And then we have xclip.run. If that doesn't work, we're gonna say return, oh, actually also here, I'm gonna return an error. Um, and we're gonna say xclip.arcs failed with this error. Um, yep, that should actually be it. So now if I, yeah, that didn't work. Um, why did it not work? I mean, it looks correct to me, um, <laughs> which is how all bugs start out. So let's say go build and then just do an S trace on copy title for go. Oh, um, the xclip process actually needs to stick around and I think that is what we're seeing here. Um, so if we do this, oh yeah, so it did actually copy. Um, why if we do this, huh? Why did we think that it didn't work earlier? Uh, go run copy title to go. Huh, no, it does work for sure, huh. All right, fair enough. Um, so now it's a simple matter of hooking one up to the other, I think. Um, not button one, instead we're gonna say exec no startup ID because this is not a graphical program. Uh, go bin copy title for i3 after we say go install. There we go. Um, gonna say i3 reload. Um, and now, uh, let me see. If I do this and then that, I get the title. If I do this, I get the title. Let's see if I do this, I get the title after the click is evaluated. Oh, because of the release. Very nice. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Welcome to the stream. Um, yeah, so this should already be it. This uh, might've been a simple change after all. So um, if I click on here, well, I, I clicked twice. So uh, let's see, if I click here. Yeah, cool, this could come in handy. Um, so I'm gonna give this a shot, see um, how it works. Um, if it works well in my day-to-day -day use, I'm gonna keep it and if no, um, it's gonna sink into obscurity. Uh, yeah, so can I get i3 for Mac, please? Huh, um, if only it was so easy. I mean, you can totally run it on Mac as long as you're using X11 on Mac as well, but that's not what most people um, are asking for. I think there are a couple of promising tiling window managers though uh, for the Mac, um, but I cannot give you a recommendation because I have no idea. Yeah, um, so this is all the code. Um, I'm gonna stuff this into a repository at some point when it's convenient for me. But um, yeah, this, so this was the whole process, right? How much did this take us? Just a couple minutes to implement this little feature here. Um, so what I wanna demonstrate is um, how we can use um, your own programs or scripts or um, you know, shell pipelines, whatever you have, whatever you wanna combine to talk to i3 and make it do something new um, like that. Um, if you have any, any questions or any, you know, if you have an idea for a thing that you wanna build with i3 and you don't know how, it would be a good time to ask that question. Um, maybe we can like think about it a little bit. All right, um, so let's see. The CI has passed for this and merging is blocked because everything needs a review um, and our reviewer has not yet responded. So we're just gonna leave this there. All right, um, so I mean, if nobody has any questions or anything that they wanna see specifically, um, I'm just gonna keep on working on this and gonna probably look into um, the pthreads for i3 dump lock. Um, you've seen me use i3 dump lock at this point a couple of times already um, to freshen up your memory. If I just do i3 dump lock like this, um, interesting. Oh yeah, it's enabling the shm lock for now only while i3 dump lock is running. Um, it used to be that if I just run it once, it would enable the log and then I could run it again um, and just view the log. 
Um, now I think we prefer the uh, log dash f, and then it's only logging for the duration that you have this running. If you cancel it, it actually stops, um, which is a little bit nicer resource wise. But uh, you know, these couple of messages not like they are a big deal uh, in terms of resource consumption. So, but the thing is, um, the i3 dump log dash f. Um, the way this works, um, and it probably makes sense to uh, let me see, walk you through this. Uh, i3 i3 dump log main. Um, the log file that i3 produces lives in a shared memory segment. So uh, in def shm by default, I think uh, it uses shm open. So you know, if, if your shared memory is somewhere else, it goes somewhere else. Um, but it's using shared memory so that in order to print a log, you don't need i3 to actually work. Um, this is an important distinction because it means that if i3 just crashed, you can still dump the log. Um, because the only thing that it needs for dumping the log is an atom that it sets on the x11 root window. So that's stayed stored in the X server. And with this atom, it locates the shared memory log file that i3 is using. Um, so this is good for reliability, right? Um, even if i3 crashed catastrophically, you can still read its log. So this is great. Um, for example, if i3 crashes and it shows you the crash dialog, you can just switch to a virtual console using control alt f1 or something like that, or uh, SSH into your computer and just run i3 dump log and you will have the log. Um, so we wanna keep that property, um, but um, the way we are informed right now about changes to the shared memory log file is we don't pull um, we're using pthread broadcast conditional variables. Um, this might seem a little bit weird at first, but this is a way of waking up a bunch of different processes when something happens in one process, and then they can uh, read the new entries in the log. Um, this seemed to work okay, and we've been using this for many, many years. Um, but I've recently stumbled upon an interesting corner case where this fails catastrophically. Um, and that is if you just, um, like you spin up a couple of dump lock processes and then you suspend them and then you kill them. And it might happen that when you do that, you actually hang your whole i3 and then your whole session hangs. So it's certainly not a good experience. Um, the reason why it hangs, I think, is it has to do with like pthread and how the broadcast condition variables work. And maybe like I was triggering a weird path where it did lock and then not unlock or something like that. Um, or, you know, I, I don't know for sure what's happening there, but I also know that this has been an odd choice to begin with. And instead of doubling down on debugging what is weird and how we can, if we can uh, fix this, um, I think we should just switch to something more standard, which is why I made the suggestion to just use um, Unix sockets for obtaining the log from i3, because I think there's the two situations, right? There's either i3 has crashed catastrophically and you still want to dump the log, but in that case, you're not going to get any new lines. Or you are interested in the new lines, but for new lines to be produced, i3 must be running anyway. So for the specific case of following the i3 log output, I think it is OK to actually assume that i3 is working. So we can just connect to it and just receive all of the log messages from like a Unix socket. And I think that should be much simpler. Uh, the one little tricky bit here is that we need to sort of coordinate where we do the handover, right? Um, and actually, like now that we're talking about it, maybe the easiest way to do this is to not do it, right? Um, so by handover, I mean uh, currently i3 dump log, it prints the whole log and then it follows new lines. Um, when we print a log and then follow in a different way, we would print from shared memory and then follow on a Unix socket. And we would need to figure out like the last log line that we printed, is it already received on the Unix socket or not? And are we gonna miss a line or not? So that sort of synchronization is gonna be tricky, but maybe we can avoid this altogether by um, when you request i3 dump log to follow, we would just always stream the entire log out of i3 via the socket and then the following lines. And that way uh, we have atomic coordination, so to say, or we avoided coordination entirely by just making it atomic. And that is certainly a good design choice. Like whenever you can avoid uh, coordination, avoid it. Um, so that is like the rough plan of action. Uh, let me know in the chat if you have any questions or remarks. Um, and yeah, I think the, the next step would probably be to um, make i3 listen on an additional socket and then just connect to that socket and make i3 spool the log to that socket. Um, that is does roughly my plan of action.
Cool. Um, so one thing we can take a look at, and I don't think, I would be surprised if we started dump log, but we actually do. Wow. Um, see, sometimes I'm wrong about what things we do test and what we don't test. Um, today I've been wrong both times, where I first assumed that we test more of the low-level messages, um, and maybe not the high-level stuff. But it looks like we actually do um, we actually do both. Um, not the following feature though, um, but the the basic functionality of i3 dump block, which is nice. It's good that we do this. Yeah. Um, but then uh, I think this test is not going to be the point where we want to extend it, or maybe it is at the very end. Um, but maybe we do. Maybe we're going to do a specific test that just directly um, connects uh, instead of running i three dump log. Maybe. Well, we'll see. Um, this would be one of the things that would be very natural today to do and go for me uh, in terms of concurrency and where data goes and where buffers are, etc. And it's harder to do it in Perl because I'm not as familiar anymore. Um, I used to be more familiar like 10 years ago when I was using it more. Um, so we're going to see, like a, a simple thing should be possible easily. Um, a more elaborate test construction might not be in the cards on the stream today. Cool. Um, so let's get started. Um, we have a source IPC. Uh, I think this is, this should probably be where we set up the listeners, right? Yeah, we have an IPC create socket, um, which creates an IPC socket. and then binds on it, listens on it. And I think, where do we actually, oh, I think it returns it. Oh yeah, so IPC create socket. It is called from elsewhere, specifically from main. Um, and that is also where we do the callback handling. So in i3, we use uh, an event loop library called libf like EV for event, I suppose. Um, it is sort of a little bit obscure or minimalist, but that fits within the the broader theme of i3, I think. Um, it is not like entirely intuitive to use it. Like we have literally needed years to get right the integration of doing an X11 event loop processing and using F. But now that we have it right, I think it is actually very reliable and um, yeah, I, I don't see a need to switch away from it, but it's not necessarily the same choice that I would make if I were to look for a new library nowadays to do the same thing. So anyway, um, what we do with it here is um, we initialize an IO watcher so that whenever there is any IO activity on the IPC socket, we call IPC new client, which will then accept the connection and handle it. Um, so let's have a quick look at how this works. Uh, I PC new client to refresh our memory. Um, yeah, what it does is an accept on the listening socket. Uh, and then actually we can jump into this. Yeah, it says IPC new client on file descriptor. Um, and here we actually initialize a new F handler, uh, give it a write callback and a read callback, uh, insert it in the list of clients and then off we go. So this is, it's sort of event-based um, an event-based model that we're using here. Uh, so what we're looking to do is um, dot files. Yeah, hey, let me uh, let me actually add this right now, right away. Um, dot files. Uh, I call my repo config files, but dot files is a totally okay alias for it. So let me add this and then also config files for symmetry. Submit, okay, try again now. So, um, very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to, to look into my config files um, and pick and choose what you think is, is good. And good evening, yeah, welcome. Uh, glad to have you all hang out with me on the stream today. So what we want to do is um, let's just call it log socket. That is that is okay. Um, IPC create 
log socket. Actually, maybe this actually shouldn't go into the IPC stuff. I think, yeah, we have a log.c file as well, which concerns itself with the other details of like this whole shared memory logging setup. Um, and, you know, the vlog stuff with the log levels, you know, all of these sorts of little helper functions that every non-trivial C program eventually writes its own version of. Uh, not great. Um, you know, this is one of the things where it is a lot harder to do a lot of things in C than it is in other languages. I can really not recommend anyone use C for new development today. Cool. So log.h, um, we're going to add a new function here. I'm going to say void uh, log create socket that is consistent. We're going to pass in const character a socket path so that it is configurable um, to do add comment. We're going to write this later. Uh, log.c actually, let me use my fuzzy finder, log.c. Cool. Um, all right, so this would be log create socket going to say, just going to make it a, a hard-coded version here, um, just for now. Um, this should totally be configurable later and auto-detected, etc., and be placed in the xdg runtime directory and you know all the good stuff of modern Linux environments. But for now, for testing, this is good. Uh, so let's do the error check. If we couldn't create the socket, we're just going to print an error. Uh, could not create the log socket. Um, I three dump log dash f will not work. I'm not sure if we need the backslash n here. Um, no, the rest of the other messages have them, so let's just keep it for consistency. Uh, all right, and then if it actually did work, um, actually, let me not type all of this stuff. Let me just copy it. Uh, so we're gonna allocate a new IPC IO. IPC new client should be log new client. IPC socket should be log socket. Main loop should be this. We're going to rename Eagle rename from IPCIO to logio. Yeah, renames in all the places. Um, why is it still squiggly lined? Oh, because it doesn't. What? It does not have the function prototype. Does it not? It should have. Um, this might just be an artifact of us not recompiling for a little while. Let's build this. Oh boy, uh, void value not ignored, as it ought to be. Um, did we say void here? Oh yeah, it should create, it should return the socket file descriptor, not void. Um, so yeah, control reaches end of non-void function. Yeah, that is most certainly correct because we haven't implemented it yet. So create socket is where we're gonna steal this from. Um, alrighty. Let's see what we need to change. So socket path, instead of file name, just a variable being called differently, but that's okay. I think I prefer socket path because it's more descriptive instead of file name. Uh, and then we have a couple of headers, uh, which are you know undeclared identifiers here and there. So I think the IPC has a couple of additional includes. Uh, I'm just, for simplicity, I'm just gonna copy them all. I think a couple of them are actually duplicate. Um, the FIO we will need um, because we will add new app handlers. File control we already have. Libgen, I don't think we need that here. Same for local edge and standard int. So we just wanna make sure we have sysocket, which we didn't before, and sysun for Unix sockets and Unix standard includes, we already had that. So that should do it, yeah. Uh, log new client undeclared. Did you mean IPC new client? See see how good this compiler is? It even tells us where we're going to copy and paste the function from. <laughs> um, this still squiggly line, but maybe that is... Why is that? Well, we can figure this out in a little bit when compilation actually fails. Oh, it does fail already. Okay. So where do we, where do we decline? Oh, is this maybe... Let's see. Yeah, that is where the libgen comes in. So we do need it after all. Um, okay. Okay. This looks better. And then set non block, we also don't have that. I think that is like an i3 specific helper func somewhere. Oh, currently it's in the ipc.c. So we'll need to factor this out. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair. I'm um, just going to do like a lib i3 
uh, nonblock.c so that you know any common code goes into lib i3. Uh, nonblock. And then we have an include lib i3.h. Uh, this can of course no longer be static. to do add comment. Actually, it's quick to do, don't need it to do. Um, the two asterisks in here make it so that Doxygen will pick it up. Um, I'm not a friend of Doxygen. I don't think, I don't think it's helpful to work with i3 to use Doxygen. Some people are so used to it that they have a different point of view. For them, we keep this, um, but I wouldn't recommend it otherwise. Um, let's see what else we have. So uh, lib i3 is the thing we include in all of these. I'm not sure. Yeah, we we'll probably need like the file control and maybe more headers for uh, the rest here. Um, and in the mason.build, let me see. Yeah, we'll need to add the new source file here. So lib i3 nonblock.c. Uh, yeah, so Mason just recognized that it needed to reconfigure it, did that, and then it rebuilt. I like Mason. It is very uh, descriptive and nice and fast and modern. Um, certainly the best C build system that I've dealt with in the open source world. Um, if that is a good or bad bar, uh, you will have to decide. But um, yeah, for the context of working on C software, definitely consider switching to Mason if you're still stuck on auto tools or CMake or something else. All right, and then we have um, R, which comes from R.h. Not entirely sure why that is not included, but hey. So, okay. Um, so now we can use set non-block from all of the files um, so that no longer clashes. And now in the log.c, um, let me see if anything here actually needs to be different. I don't think it needs to be. So we're probably gonna wanna factor this out as well into lib i3. Um, I'm going to add a to do here um, refactor common socket creation code between IPC create socket and log create socket. We're going to do this before committing, um, but not necessarily right now because um, I just want to get something working quickly. But I do want to clean it up before committing because when you're introducing new code, um, it makes sense to you know, spend a little bit of effort so that later it not doesn't need to be cleaned up by somebody else. Um, so if you add something new, might as well make it clean. Um, but if you're dealing with something that already exists, you don't necessarily need to clean it up right then, right there. Okay, um, so log create socket, we have this. Let's switch back to IPC. There is an IPC new client. That is the one that we wanna have run uh, whenever a new connection comes in on the socket. So um, IPC new client should be a log new client. Handler for activity on the listening socket, meaning the new client is just connected and we should accept him. Uh, let's make this non-gendered while we're here. Sets up the event handler for activity on the new connection and inserts the file descriptor into the list of clients. List of log clients. I'm the maintainer of the i3 package for Void Linux. Looking forward to the change to Mason. Very nice. Um, thank you for maintaining i3 in Void Linux. It is very important um, to the success of i3 that there are package maintainers uh, in all of the Linux distributions. Um, really, installing a package via the distribution is the primary way of distributing packages such as i3 that are like part of your, let's say, low-level experience where you wouldn't spin up a Docker container for it. Um, so thank you to you and all of the other maintainers of i3 in Linux distributions. Uh, your help is much appreciated. All right, so we have the IPC new client here. Log new client uh, is what we're going to call into. Um, aside from that, this just does very common logic. Um, and then the main bit is going to be in here. Um, so again, we can probably factor this out. And I'm just going to add another to do here. Consider refactoring with IPC new client. So that we uh, take a look at this later. Uh, so this would be a log new client on file descriptor. This would be a log client on IPC client. Set non blocking. Okay, make this log client. Log client. The file descriptor we need. Uh, read and write callback. Fair enough. Um, we don't actually need to look at. Wait, let's see. So this would only ever be broadcast. 
Um, but we also do the initial spooling of the existing log into the file descriptor, but we can probably do this here because at that point we have already accepted it. So I think the only thing we need to do, like, oh, I think we need the writable callback um, so that we know when it is okay to send data out of the buffer. Um, yeah, that is a bit unfortunate. So this has been like, this is a, like a longstanding problem of uh, this approach of doing IPC where you have a buffer in the Unix socket, right? Like you, you do a connection from the client to the server, which is i3 in this case. Um, and once you have opened the connection, you will have a buffer in there for reading and writing. So if the server wants to send you too much data at once, um, it will be throttled because the buffer is full and the throttling in this case is the i3 process not being able to complete the write source call. So your whole X session will appear stuck or you know the windows that you have open will continue to function, but you can no longer switch between them because your i3 hangs. Um, and that's not a great situation to be in. And we are kind of setting ourselves up for a similar situation here in that if we have a lot of log output and we have a slow consumer, that might block the sender. Um, so that's not great. Um, one thing we could do here is just forcibly kill the connection whenever that happens, whenever it's non-writable, or we could do buffering. Um, I think for fixing the IPC um, situation, like the, the longstanding issue with IPC buffers um, running full, um, we have actually introduced like uh, a write callback that you can see here and like um, a, a buffer. But I wanna be sure and actually take a quick look at this just so that I remember this correctly. Yeah, we have uh, just a buffer here and a buffer size and read and write callbacks. So we have already introduced like a buffer here so that um, just the memory will run full um, and not the actual buffer between client and program, uh, client and server program. Um, but what I'm gonna do here, I think is, um, we're just gonna ignore this for now and then I'm gonna add a to-do for later. Uh, consider introducing buffering similar to the IPC interface to reduce problems with slow consumers. I'm gonna say log new client connected on this file descriptor. All clients should be log clients. Client that works. Oh shit, I'm modifying the wrong function. <laughs> okay, um, let me copy my current changes. Undo all of this up until here and actually switch to the right function. Copy paste in here. Uh, lock client, delete this old stuff. All right, situation salvaged. Um, and in here, I think the definition of the IPC client, uh, where do we have it? Oh, it's actually in the IPC.h, good. Um, Let's say log.h here. Though, oh yeah, no, I think we want this to be available to other parts of the i3 code base so that we can actually uh, just sync data into there. Though it's probably okay if we scope this to log.c. So we don't need to make this public for now. We can just uh, define it within log.c and have it scoped to that compilation unit. And of course, this will be log client, log client, log client. Only has a file descriptor. Cool. I'm going to clang format this later, so we don't need to care about the, the specific formatting here. Um, and then the other missing bit that we need to copy from here is this initializer. Uh, and in fact, we need the other bit of it as well, which is the forward declaration. I thought. Huh. Um, oh, this is, huh. yeah. No Java, but haven't learned C yet. Yeah, don't bother. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, Unless you're very much into low level stuff, um, I wouldn't recommend getting into C too much. Lock client, all clients, lock clients. Yeah, so this is weird because I would format it like this, but Clang format formats it like that. I don't mind what Clang format does, but obviously this just tripped me up. So, eh. 
Okay, log clients. Good. Um, okay, so now they should be added here. So I think, oh yeah, there's no forward declaration. New client on file descriptor. Where is the forward declaration here? Uh, is it in ipc.h? It is. Don't think it needs to be for uh, for logging though. I think we can just do a forward declaration. Actually, we can just like move this above that one. That way it's declared. All right. Uh, log new client. Oh yeah. Um, now we need to add it to the header. See, this is one of the things that you totally get into the habit of forgetting um, when you no longer need to do them. Like adding things to headers. Another thing that I do not miss about writing C. Okay, uh, it links. This is good. Um, so one thing we can do now is uh, we can actually use Zephyr um, as we did earlier to test this. Um, let me see. Ooh, yeah. Uh, display i3. Going to use i3 build i3 dash verbis and all of the debug and this should be three uh yeah so now ooh this is unexpected um we have something wired wrong here i think because you know it's saying wait oh yeah i think i know what we wired wrong um, I think in the, there might be like a global side effect here in that we are probably saving the location of the IPC socket. Yeah, here it is. Current socket path equals resolved. Um, do not refactor. So this is something that we will actually, this should not be in here, um, but in the IPC.C, current socket path. Um, if we end up refactoring the IPC create socket code that is shared, this should not be refactored. So we're gonna mark it here um, so that we stumble over it later. Okay, um, log.c, so yeah, if we build this again, it should no longer have the weird side effect. Oh, <laughs> nice. So now you can see how it looks like when i3 crashes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the dialogue is a little bit cut off, but that is just because of my uh, Zephyr screen size, I believe. Um, yeah, please report a bug for this. You can either attach a GDB or choose from the following backtrace, um, and then you can dump a, a backtrace. Um, we should be able to see, yeah, the signal handler. So we see i3 crashed with signal 11, which is segmentation fault. Um, so one thing we can do now is, um, let's see here. The one that we just started so the one that I started earlier is my session one, and the one we just started right now would be, wow, there's still some of them hanging around here. Uh, but this one, I think is the, is the PID that we're looking for. Oh yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't want to do this. Um, by default, let me uh, quickly change the, the CTL setting for this. Uh, yeah, well, let's hope that this works. Oh yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, so we have debug symbols. Um, whoops, this is not what I meant. Uh, backtrace is what I meant. So now we can see where it crashed. Um, <laughs> um, okay, wait, no. It's, oh yeah, so the socket is now null and that is certainly not good. Uh, let's see why it is null. Uh, in the ipc.c, yeah, I thought we still set it. So the, the current socket path should still be set. Oh, yeah, um, we free it here. <laughs> the joys of manual memory management. 
Yeah, now it, it works at least. So we see nothing, right? Because the config says that there's no bar visible by default, it's in hide mode. Um, I think, yeah, if I press the modifier here, you can see that the bar appears in the Zephyr instance that I'm using to test here. Um, and now um, we should be seeing that um, there should be a temp log.soc. Yeah, um, and it is created 2129. So that is the current time. Um, now, if we say, um, what is a good tool that we can use? I think we can use SoCat to actually uh, like display, like connect to the Unix socket and display what's happening. I'm not sure if we can use Netcat as well, um, or if just a cat might actually work. No, so cat will not work because you need to actually connect to it. Um, and this doesn't actually result in any log message here either. So we can use SoCat um, and it has primitives for Unix connect. Uh, so let's see if there is a Unix connect example. Uh, it might be simple enough like if if people are super familiar with the syntax of SoCat, now would be a good time to uh, help me get this right. Um, otherwise, exactly two addresses required. I think if we just do like standard out, that might do something. Yeah, um, free IPC client, log new client. Um, did we expect an IPC client? Not necessarily. So maybe there's still something wrong in terms of wiring here. But uh, one thing that we do now see is the log message that we added, log new client on file descriptor. Um, so that's certainly progress. Um, we could connect to the socket that we now established. Okay, so what does the what does the log new client do here actually? Is there any is there anything else that we could have gotten wrong? I don't know. No, I mean it looks okay to me. Um so maybe the other IPC connection here is just coincidence, especially because it does the byte order detection. Oh, oh, this might be, ha. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't have it open anymore, but I think this is an artifact of what I configured earlier, where um, if I click on the title bar, it does the copy title um, that we did earlier. And that is um, an IPC client, right? Um, could not connect to i3 in a such file directory. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we might've messed up. Um, how did we do this? I don't know. Um, we might've messed up our current like session and socket path. I'm just gonna do i3 restart. Oh, it also can't connect, of course. Oh, maybe, maybe it actually unlinked our existing socket. Would it do that? Let's see. So there is a get socket path. Yeah, that socket is gone. Ooh. Um, oh yeah, it might be that it cleaned up this... No, why would it clean up the directory? Not entirely clear to me. Um, also not entirely sure if we can actually salvage this. Um, I think there might be signals to do reloads. Um, but yeah, if there is not like... So it's not like an active socket on which I could connect. I, I don't think I can I can actually salvage this. Um, in that case, so let's see. Let me just do like a little cleanup here. Um, and one thing we're gonna try, let's see how this works. All right. All right, cool. Uh, something has happened. Um, I have just restarted i3, like I literally uh, killed the process and then started up again. We can see that the windows are still all there. Um, it's just we've lost our workspace um, arrangement, right? Because I didn't do like an in-place restart where it could serialize the layout. Um, instead, I, I killed it, right? But at least I didn't lose my session. So I'm just gonna quickly like move stuff around again. So the chat was in three, browser was in two, um, the... This terminal was four, and then I think on one, we just had like an Emacs i3, like that. All right. Um, 
So let's see, you know, maybe um, as we do the test again, maybe it'll become apparent where exactly we screwed up our existing session. Discord, um, there's no Discord here. Um, what did you expect this command would do? Display, um, let's do this again, actually. Um, let's do a get socket path first. Get socket path. And yeah, so now we've listed this before. Uh, let's see what happens here. Still there. Okay, so that's not it at least. Though, yeah, no, that's fine. That should be fine. Good. Um, so now let's um, clear the log lines here a little bit and do the SOCAD from earlier. Um, yeah, and now we see exactly what we expected. Um, this channel about encoding C and C++. Um, yeah, I'm doing some C programming here, um, but it is not a generic channel for uh, getting help or talking about C in general. Um, specifically, I'm working on the i3 window manager, um, which, uh, let's see, here's the website. Um, this is a tiling window manager for Linux and other uh, Unix operating systems. Um, and we are changing the way that its debug logs are being printed. Um, so there is a functionality where um, you can do i3 dump log dash F O. Um, Oh, apparently I'm, huh, interesting. I'm not sure why I was using a different version before and I'm no longer now, but okay. Um, oh, this is very interesting. Oh, I think I might have an intuition about what's going on here. Ah, yes. Okay, um, so I know why the, why the socket is being operated now. Um, and I think, uh, huh. So I'm not entirely sure where we set it. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, oh, we set it, we set it here. Yeah. Um, so it turns out we have this environment variable called i3 sock which we do set in anything that i3 starts for compatibility reasons. So that for example, if you have like a, a third party IPC program um, do you have a GitHub account? Yes. Um, let me pull up the URL for you. Uh, um, when we, um, yeah, so we pass this environment variable so that we tell third-party tools where to look for the socket, but also i3 respects this environment variable, meaning that it will create a socket in that location. So if you sort of run an i3 session within an i3 session, uh, it gets this variable and then that's no good, right? Um, because it will override the main uh, running i3 version's socket path. And that is, that will lose connection with i3, right? Like no longer is it possible to connect to the IPC interface. Hey, welcome on the stream. Um, all right, so uh, let's go back here. Okay, so what we'll need to do is, um, I'm gonna need to do the whole restart dance once more. Um, so let me actually close all of this, um, this one we can keep running. This one should be running. Um, right, and this time, now that I'm restarting i3 once more, cool. I'm gonna shuffle windows around, three, two, one is gonna be max. Um, this time, what we're gonna do is uh, Zephyr. Uh, we're gonna make it, oops, one sec. Uh, okay, something is not behaving as I expected to, sorry. Oh, yeah, I think I see. Oh, yeah. Um, now I got it. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, this is all a bit weird because I'm actually using um, Zephyr in um, my regular streaming setup. So now I have Zephyr and Zephyr. So this is super confusing. 
I think it's really impressive. Luckily, I, I didn't never run into such a problem. Yeah, <laughs> lucky you. Um, okay, so now uh, this one here goes here. Okay, and now we're gonna say i3 sock equals empty. Or maybe we just do unset i3 sock and then run this. Okay. So now if we do i3 dash dash more version and i3 dump block dash f, yeah, now it still works. Okay, so now we figured out the, the problem with our environment, right? So this can happen, right? Um, and it's good to sort of take a, t take a step back and, and figure out where things go wrong before uh, you lose too much time in weird environment issues. So let's do the SOCAD again. Uh, we see the log message. Kill the SOCAD, okay. Um, now we have everything in place that we can actually start iterating on this feature. Cool, so log.h, um, log.c. So yeah, we should probably just, um, for the spooling, uh, to spool the log into the new connection. And for now, we're just gonna say, write to the client's file descriptor, hello world, backslash n, string length, hello world, backslash n. Build it. Rerun this, rerun that. We see the hello world, very nice. Um, so now the, the socket itself is working. Um, the one next step we can do is either we can start spooling the entire log into the new connection, or uh, we can wire it up so that new log messages go into all of these sockets. Um, let me actually see um, how the how the logging is set up. I think the debug log goes into vlog and vlog is the main workhorse of this log uh, machinery. And then we have message um, and the whole like ring buffer thing. And yeah, we just write the message to standard out um, if we are asked to print directly instead of to the shared memory log. So message is exactly what we need to print. Uh, Okay. Oh yeah, we, we we also have the length, so it needs to be uh, yeah yeah the length is what caps it. Um, okay, cool. So no socket on PHP was my first contact with socket on C on a long time ago. Yeah, um, socket API is not necessarily the greatest on C, but um, yeah, once you figure it out, it is kind of okay. Um, but yeah, fun times. All right, so we copy the buffer into the log log, et cetera. I think this might be just as good a place. Or actually, let's let's do it at the end so that we have less chance of um, doing something wrong here. So log broadcast to clients message and its length. And I think that that should be fine as a first approximation for the signature that we need. We say void const character message. Uh, we're gonna need to have a look, a careful look at the size of len because we need to match it. Um, integer size mismatches is a common problem in C that has potentially disastrous results. Um, and then we're gonna do a for declaration here. Okay, um, what this should do is tail Q should iterate through kind of like all clients. So we can just reuse this loop, I think. Oh ah, yeah, from IPC send event, that is, that looks about right. But instead of all clients, this should be log client, this should be a log client. Um, and this whole nesting thing is pretty ugly here, so. Um, we're going to avoid all of that. Instead, we have a current file descriptor. We're going to write to it. We're going to write the message and the length. Yeah, um, let's see what this does, if anything. Do the socat. Um, oh, yeah, log. Very nice. 
Um, yeah, this is very satisfying. This was quick um, to wire up, right? So now we have the login here. We can see if we move the mouse cursor, um, i3 is actually very chatty. Uh, <laughs> it even logs when you move the mouse cursor, um, which sounds funny at first, but then you realize, well, on a tiling window manager, everything is always obscured by windows. Um, so mouse cursor moves on the root window actually happen rarely. Uh, sort of an edge case in a tiling window manager, but fun if you think about it standalone. Okay. Um, so what's next? Uh, yeah, spooling the existing log, right? So that we don't need to play catch up on the client side and make it a little bit nicer uh, for the consumer of this log, um, which is good. Always nice to have the consumer lightweight and the heavy lifting be done by the server. All right, um, so this is where we would need to do the spooling. Um, and for that, we can just take a look at the i3 dump log program itself, which already kind of does this. Um, it reads it all out of the shared memory log file. Um, so we'll need to kind of adjust the code a little bit, maybe. Uh, let's see, so we have the shared memory log header. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll need to kind of review what this does and verify that this is indeed what we want. Um, so we need to like dive into what the header actually contains and how like the string buffer works with the offset next write. Luckily, it's all commented. Nice to know this channel, greetings from Spain. Hey, um, let's go to rest, see you soon. Yeah, nice, nice, uh, nice of you to check in. Uh, see you soon. So byte offset where the next line will be written to. Okay. Uh, so this would be, oh yeah, log buffer is like the base offset and then we have offset next write. Um, and we have offset last wrap. Actually, that might be nicer. Oh, and then, oh, we just, we just sort of, first need to print old content, yeah. Ah, gotcha, yeah, okay. So, oh yeah, the next write in the ring buffer um, like either you have a lot of empty afterwards and then um, once you wrap around you have like the first couple of lines um, or if you have already wrapped around once uh, which is likely in i3 because it logs a lot um, the the next one is also like where all of the previous history starts right because the the most like the oldest content will be overwritten next so that's why okay um so we have this walk pointer which we'll need to declare and that should be the same type as the socket buffer. Let's see, where do we declare walk? Oh wow, this is even a global in the context of dump log. Oh yeah, there we are. Uh, so these are just character pointers. That's okay. Um, log buffer though. Um, yeah, we will need to find the, the proper name for this. Um, this is okay, I think. Then we have the check for wrap and print till end. I think we're just gonna like, we will need to adjust this actually because it uses write to standard hour directly, sorry, to standard output directly. So I'll do like this. And at this point, I really want this to be formatted. <laughs> okay, so I've just kind of like inlined these two functions um, where they are used so that we can then start modifying them. I find that it's helpful to kind of do the refactoring step by step. And the first step really is to just like copy the code over and then adjust it from there so as to not get confused. Oh, check for wrap, we actually need it multiple times. So we actually probably do want it to be a proper function. Oh, but then, um, yeah, this is a bit annoying because now, um, you know, it has the side effect of writing to standard output, which we don't want here. Uh, so either we tell it where to write to, which could just be a file descriptor actually. So that seems fine. And then we just pass like the connection file descriptor in there. Um, yeah, I, I think we're gonna do it like that. Um, and I think for now, we'll just put this into the log.c directly. And maybe later we put it into lib i3. I love to do 
consider refactoring into the bad thing. Oh uh, yeah, this is one too many now, and this should be formatted, please. And the printl end we can probably leave in land here. So now we have to check for wrap. Um, this write will need to go to client fd. Oh yeah, check for wrap will need to receive the client fd. Um, int file descriptor. This should no longer hard code. Then we have the wrap count here. Uh huh. Right. Um, yeah, I think this is sort of academic in the sense that uh, it's probably not going to wrap around in between the two invocations that we have here, but yeah, fine. Wrap count. Where is it defined? Oh, in here. Um, what? No, that's not that's not the right one. That's not the one I wanted. Um, actually, let me. Oh yeah, can't compile it right now. Yeah. Okay. Need to find this myself. Wrap count. Oh yeah, this is where it's defined. Huh? I must have missed this earlier. Uh, I'm just gonna put it here. Eh, not great. But one thing at a time. Walk is undeclared for sure. Um, static const. Current. Oh no, we can't do this. Now, this is this is this is a bad route. This is gonna lead us to nowhere. Um, because if we if we're gonna start using global variables, like this worked in the i three dump log because it's one process per like log dump. But here we can't do it um, because we have one connection and we can't just say that we will only uh, that we will always only ever have one connection. Um, we will need to serve multiple connections. So no globals allowed here. Uh, so one thing we could do is um, return the walk pointer. Um, and that's probably what I'm gonna try to do first. So check for wrap, this becomes that. Okay. Oh, this compiles. Very nice. Um, in that case, uh, let's see what it does. Oh. Um, we do see the hello world. Oh, um, log buffer is. Oh no, it is defined actually. This is the the correct name, I think. Yeah. Um, then why does it? Not do anything. Oh, um, no, we do have the debug log enabled, so that's not it. Do we maybe have the debug log enabled, but not the shared memory log? That could be a problem. Uh, so I think we're going to need to start our test i3 instance with shared memory log size 25 times kilo megabytes. Ooh, what? Um, oh, one asterisk too many. Okay. No, that's not it. So why why is that not it? Uh, SHM log, yeah, it's all enabled, huh? Um, okay, well let's see if we find out why this is not happening. Maybe we go back to the um, actually. This is the arrangement I want. Um, hmm. So let's go through the code path here again. Oh, we also have a header global variable. Yeah, and this is this is like safe to do without locks or anything because this is all single threaded. Um, but event driven. Um, so where where are we going wrong? Um, we start here. Well, I think the print till end is really what should print us all of the remaining log messages, right? 
But maybe we do something silly somewhere where we skip the rest. If anybody has any tips for what to check or is spotting the bug, uh, do let me know. Oh, maybe, yeah. That is one of the things that we wanted to change. Uh, it must no longer be a global variable. Is it updated here? It is. Okay. Though, right. I think I think we want this uh, for simplicity. We're just going to update this outside, and then in the check for wrap, we're going to pass it in, and it's no longer a global variable. And then in here we do wrap count, and in here wrap count, um, and we never have another iteration. Wrap count undeclared. Oh, of course. Okay. Let's start this again. Still no. Okay. Interesting. Um. So apparently that was not that was not a problem. Oh yeah. I see it, uh, or I see a problem. Um, we did declare the walk pointer inside of the scope. So that would mean that that walk pointer was not referring to the earlier one, but to the global one, um, which would just mess with our log. It is um, still no dice. It is unfortunate that um, all of these variables are like doubly used, so to say here, um, because they are so generic in terminology. Okay, but one of the things that we can kind of try here is uh, no, this is this is declared to zero. That matches. So one thing we can do here is. Um, Printing the remaining percent d bytes of log. Just log this. And then one thing we can also log is um, the log buffer pointer and the offset next write. Uh, let's make it consistent. Log buffer, buffer, offset. Yay for printf debugging. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, this looks wrong. <laughs> the remaining negative uh, so and so many thousand bytes of log, yeah. Um, so why is that wrong? Where is it calculating it? It's looking at log buffer uh, and then it's using header offset next right. Minus walk. Walk, oh, because walk is also never in, no, wait, it is initialized, it is initialized here. I find it good to be able to visually compare these debug messages um, one after the other, which is why I just reformatted it like that. Let's see if that helps make anything more clear. Oh, yeah, the walk equals nil. That that looks like a bad thing. Uh, aha. 
Yeah, this should be return walk. Oh, there we go. We have the logs pulled to us. And we get new messages. Very nice. So this is what we wanted to have, right? Um, so proof of concept is working. Um, and uh, within time even. <laughs> Just so within time. Um, yeah, so it is nearing uh, three hours here. Um, so I think I'm going to phase this out. Um, now is a good opportunity to ask me any sort of parting questions. Um, I'm going to wrap up this feature off stream, I think. Um, I think you've seen enough. Like now we have a good intuition of how this works, right? Like i3 opens the socket, you connect to it, you get the log. If new stuff comes in, it is just sent to you onto the file descriptor, uh, onto that connection. Makes sense. Um, we can do away with all of the weird pthread um, broadcast stuff. Um, and hopefully avoid bugs like that altogether then. Cool. So um, let me see if um, let me see if this actually works. Um, cool. Yeah, um, you can see this very nice. Um, so yeah, and you can also see my hand. Um, so I have like this new camera here. Um, if you have followed on Twitter, you will have seen my article. Um, actually, yeah, let me <laughs> be in the picture as well. Um, you will have seen my article about using uh, an old iPhone as an additional camera um, because I couldn't find my webcam and webcams are hard to buy right now. Um, so I have like this little stream set up. So it's nice to see it is working. Um, one thing I wanted to show you as sort of a teaser for uh, an upcoming stream uh, is the keyboard controller work that I'm doing. Uh, so uh, I have this keyboard controller here, which uh, let me go back to my desktop and um, show you a couple of pictures. So this is the keyboard that I'm using, um, the Kinesis Advantage. It is a great keyboard, um, but for various reasons, I have started to modify the keyboard controllers in there. Um, it is a fun hobby. And um, one, of the, one of the iterations that I've done here um, is the Kinex keyboard controller. And you can see here, this is like the keyboard, but from the other side. So if you open it up and look at it from the inside, this is what it looks like. The weird layout that they have, like the weird uh, shape of the key bowls is actually like the PCBs are shaped like that, as you can see here, right? Like they look like fingers um, and they are really just thin PCB that is then bent into place and soldered um, to fix it in position. Um, and the controller that I have here, um, you can see the uh, purple PCB, which was made at Oshpark. Um, their purple PCBs are sort of their trademark. Uh, the keyboard controller that I have here is uh, based on the Teensy 3.6 microcontroller. Um, I have since abandoned this particular layout. Uh, and like I did, uh, let me see um, if I go up to my blog. Um, this is the Kinex overview. So I have a post um, about the new controller that I did where um, I showed the controller that you just saw in the photo. Um, and then I showed what the issue is, uh, which is that um, in order to max out the latency, I really wanted to use USB high speed, but the USB high speed pin header is in a very unfortunate position uh, mechanically on the Teensy. Uh, so I created a custom board layout here where the USB high speed connector um, is here and the full speed connector is there and that is a much better position. But um, I have since come to circle back to the older revision um, because I wanted to give the QMK firmware a try. Um, let me actually switch back. So now that you have the uh, explanation, let me switch back to the live view here. Um, so this is an older version, but it does have the QMK firmware installed. And um, go with ARM. <laughs> uh, what's that, what is that circuit with your name? Yeah, um, let me explain. So um, go with ARM, no, um, <laughs> not yet, not right now. Um, doable, I have played around with um, what's called TinyGo a little bit, it was fun. Um, but this is, I don't think this is a good platform for it uh, in terms of support. Excuse me, it is a pain to port um, software from one uh, platform to the other, depending on you know how involved the platform is. But uh, porting TinyGo to work on this platform, uh, I don't think that's fun. Um, so what's that circuit? Um, this board here that I have here, so like this entire board is essentially a breakout board, right? So you have the Teensy microcontroller in the middle here, 
um, which is just soldered on top of the board. And then you have these connectors here, like the one at the top right, top left, bottom left, bottom right, and then an additional pin header um, at the bottom right and on the, on the left. It's actually live, yeah, no, it's not just a picture, this is live. Um, and what these do is they're sort of the way that you can connect the keyboard, right? Um, so if I switch back to um, this picture here, you can see that, and actually let me, so that you get like the full impression. So let me walk you through this step by step. So you have the keyboard, right? So this is, this is what I'm doing, right? I have a keyboard. I wanna change the electronics inside it. Like I like the keyboard form factor and shape and keys, etc. but I wanna have my own electronics run it. So um, I exchanged the key part of the keyboard. Um, I exchanged the keyboard controller um, and all of the keys are still connected to my keyboard controller and that's what the board does. Um, but now instead of using their processor, I'm using a TNZ microprocessor. So now I have full control over the firmware um, and more importantly, also over uh, any sort of latency that is being added here. So I can now measure and reason about input latency because I control the full keyboard. Um, and that's specifically what I want to do here um, in this exploration, which is why I'm bringing it up. So um, this is sort of a, a sneak peek, but what I did here is um, I have this little um, breakout board. Um, I actually have more of these. Let me uh, see if I can pull them up real quick. Um, in my electronics drawer. Yeah, there is the baggie. Um, so these are, you can buy them from uh, DigiKey, which is a large electronics distributor. And let me see. So these little breakout boards here, um, they are just like one key, right? Um, so you can solder a Cherry MX key switch into this board. Um, and then you can connect it to wherever you want. Um, and I've used this here to have just the one little key here. So this is like the loneliest keyboard controller in the world, right? It only has one key to manage, um, but it is a fully functioning keyboard. Like you can press the key and it will register the key press and your operating system will react to it. Um, I have also used this technique and these breakout boards in other um, positions where I wanted to just have a single button on like a Raspberry Pi or something. And it's very handy to just have like a proper key switch in there and I just solder it up. Um, I'm probably actually gonna do some soldering of these um, in an upcoming stream, maybe, uh, we'll see. So anyway, um, what I wanted to show you real quick um, as sort of a teaser for more um, keyboard controller oriented streams in the future is um, the latency measurements that I can do with this year. Um, so let's go um, in here, uh, open a new workspace. And what we're going to do here is uh, hit listen. So hit listen is a human interface device uh, based listening tool uh, for lack of a better word, debugging tool maybe. Um, so it prints debug messages from the microcontroller via the USB hit protocol. And that's sort of like, it, it's sort of a replacement for uh, a serial port. Um, but it's nice because you don't need to connect any extra wires and a extra um, serial adapter. Right, um, and if I press this key now, you can see that there's actually messages appearing. Um, and specifically, um, let me release this real quick. And then what I'm gonna do here is uh, change this like so. All right. Um, okay, so I've pressed this a couple of times and you've seen that the output has changed here. Um, notably, there are these lines in here um, where latency is being reported. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm measuring with a um, very fine-grained timer on the microcontroller. So these measurements are going to be very precise, um, which is important if we're dealing with uh, quantities like the ones we are dealing with here, um, where we are measuring things in microseconds um, and potentially even nanoseconds, depending on what it is specifically we want to we wanna measure. Um, and what we can see is that uh, the time between the key press to the USB report arriving um, is measured to be 530 microseconds. Um, and it also measures the time not to the arrival of the hit report, but also to the start of frame. And I'm gonna explain what this is in just a sec and how frequently the keyboard controller firmware is able to scan the entire keyboard matrix. Now keep in mind, the matrix scanning is pretty useless here because our matrix is one by one. It's just the one key that is connected. Um, so that's not gonna say anything. Um, now let me, um, 
let me pull up real quick my blog post here because it actually has an explanation of what's going on. So um, in the keyboard controller firmware, conceptually what happens is when you press down a key, um, you need to wait until the matrix scan, um, and I'm not gonna go into this here, this is for another stream, um, but you need to wait until the matrix scan passes by the key that you're pressing, um, then it detects it as pressed, then there might be a debouncing period happening, which if you implement it cleverly can be zero uh, milliseconds in terms of latency at the rising edge of the key press. Um, and then there's the USB poll happening. And the USB poll, that's where the start of frame uh, is happening. So that's the latency measurement that has the lower value. And then um, the key that I have, the single key that I have connected to my controller is mapped to caps lock. Um, this has the effect that the host will actually respond to it. So uh, when you press caps lock, it turns on the caps lock LED. And that way we get sort of a start of measurement and an end of measurement. And um, that way we can measure the entire latency of the entire USB stack. Uh, and if we switch back to the um, measurements that we're making here, we can see that from pressing the key, like from the key being detected as pressed electronically to the keyboard controller being told that it should now enable the caps lock LED, just 500 milliseconds um, sorry, microseconds have passed. Um, so this is 0 0.5 milliseconds. Um, and that is the total latency um, for you know, the Linux operating system and USB stack and hardware that I have in the middle to handle this key press. Um, so that sort of gives us the ballpark estimate of where we are. Um, and I have previously spent some time to decrease this latency from um, ranging between one milliseconds and 10 milliseconds to ranging between zero and one milliseconds, and then uh, going even further um, but what I want to show here is just that I have the um, input latency measurement stack ported to the QMK firmware, and I have ported the QMK firmware to work on the TNZ 3.6. Uh, so now in the future, we can build um, keyboards that are based on the QMK firmware, which is very desirable because it's a very advanced firmware and has a lot of good features and a lot of good improvements that's getting. Um, and we can run that on my custom keyboard controller board and we can measure the input latency of it to verify that we, have, we don't have any unnecessary slowdowns in terms of input latency in our keyboard path. Um, so this is just a sneak peek, and we're gonna talk more about this in a future stream. Um, let me catch up with the chat real quick. I've been struggling with video tearing, so YouTube videos playing on full screen in i3. I've been experimenting with Compton. Tearing happens only in full screen, um, might be due to how i3 handles full screen. Compton is no longer playing a role in full screen? No, I don't think that's true. Um, Understand if you don't want to get into such things. Yeah, I mean, the stream is um, not for like one-on-one -on -one bug reports, but it is okay to talk about this a little bit. So um, in general, in terms of tearing, um, you can try all of the things in terms of uh, what your graphics driver will allow you. Like I think in the NVIDIA driver, there's like a double or triple buffering option that you could enable. Um, tearing in general, yeah, your, your um, you know, everything needs to sort of play together, right? I think your Chrome should ideally use hardware acceleration um, and then it should be v-synced up to like the screen refresh rate. And that might be easier if you use a compositor or it might be harder if you use a compositor. Um, this is one of the tricky bits uh, in the X11 world. You can never say, oh yeah, you will have less problems by using a compositor. It might as well be that your particular workflow will have more problems and it goes the other way around. So whenever people tell me that something is not working in i3 with or without a compositor, I recommend that they try the other configuration um, and maybe they're lucky and then it works magically. Um, in general, there is no magic bullet to fix tearing. Um, it depends on your setup. You might wanna look into um, DRI um, and the like the, the DRI based page flipping thing that the Intel driver does. I think the Arch Linux wiki is a good resource on all of the various things that you can configure in terms of double and triple buffering and synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, this is one of the things where, you know, if you can't figure it out, um, ask on the i3 uh, subreddit. Um, what did I just miss? I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to refer you to the stream recording for this. Um, I was talking about my keyboard controller. I want this keyboard. Yeah, um, you should be able to build one yourself if you want um, soon. Um, the, the, all of this stuff is open hardware and open source software. So you could theoretically build one right away, but I would recommend to wait a little bit uh, longer because I think I'm gonna come up with a design that makes it very easy to build these. Thanks, funny thing is tearing happens only in i3 and full screen, not in window mode in i3 or GNOME. Interesting. Um, I think in full screen, it might be that Compton actually um, goes out of the way, so to say, because it might make the assumption that um, if you're full screening something, it might be a game, and then uh, the game should directly render to your screen and not go via Compton, because that will introduce additional latency. Uh, so maybe that is what you're looking for, and maybe you need to turn that particular feature off in Compton. 
just a thought. All right, um, I think at this point, we're gonna really cap it. Um, and I'm gonna see you all in another stream. I'm gonna check if Matt Lair is streaming currently. Um, actually, twitch.com, twitch.tv. Matt Lair, um, he is gonna stream about Go. Yeah, he is live and he is streaming. So I'm gonna send you all over there um, so you can watch him. And I'm also gonna join the chat room probably. Um, do some more Go programming. Um, I hope you enjoyed this i3 stream. Um, let me know what you think and if you want to see like um, more of this or more of different things. Um, personally, I don't do much i3 coding myself um, in my day-to-day, -day, so I'm like more, um, you know, more comfortable uh, in my Go environment. Um, but, you know, we can do one of these from time to time. Um, I think it's always nice to show how things work and give you all a little bit of context and maybe um, that will put you in a position to like build your own thing or contribute to i3 and that would be great. Um, cool, yeah, so if you have any questions or feedback, reach out on Twitter. Um, cool, yeah, I think I think that's it. So I'm gonna say, um, actually, let me set up the raid, raid channel and the layer. All right, there we go. So we're gonna raid um, Matt's channel in just a sec. Um, thanks everyone for hanging out and see you on the next stream.